I watched the announcement, I said I would not give that guy 50 bucks at a party for a startup. And I said, sell everything we had. And then we sold it and then it crashed. But I sold oh. it, but I, like I made like 30x in like two weeks or something. Uh, apparently, a few had, people had the same was, idea as you did, right? And it was a sizable amount of money. And so that's that's that was two and a half years ago, and that's what got me really excited about crypto. Actually, maybe that might that might have been December of 2017. It was somewhere in that you know that whole crazy time. But oh, I, I don't know. Time, anything, right? I, I don't know anything <laughs> about trading. I, I have the stuff out there that to be like started recording already. I mean, he's yeah. been a podcast. Come on, like, <laughs> yeah, podcast, is, podcast. Because good, because like I'm already okay, recording I got, I got and everything. So, so I was like, oh, we're starting to talk. All right. So we're, glad we're I, I took a preemptive on that and decided to record anyway. So it was it was a trick question. So guys, <laughs> welcome to the show. <laughs> uh, I'm Nemesis, of course, and we got my two homies here, Crypto Mikel and Chris. And we have up, an Pete? awesome guest with us, Rob McNeely. Awesome guest. An awesome guest. Um, so, Rob, my man, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, let's see. So, um, I am the co-founder of Tusk, which stands for the Universal Settlement Coin. Um, but personally, so I'll, I'll go the personal. No one ever says their personal stuff. Like, so I'm old. Um, I'm 48. Um, haven't been in crypto that long by compared to a lot of people. I'm not an OG. I've only been in, I've only been in it about four years, three or four years. Uh, I am a serial entrepreneur. Um, I have a day job, uh, but I've been a self-sufficient entrepreneur since a minimum of 20, eh, 2005, but I've been an entrepreneur for a couple decades. And I view everything that I do from the lens of an entrepreneur. I am not a developer. Uh, let's see, live in Salt Lake City, originally from Detroit, married with four children. Uh, been married 20 years and actually kind of like life. Actually, things are going really well for us all the way around on all fronts. So um, that's kind of the personal side. I am a recovering corporate MBA. Uh, I always tell people I had to forget about half of what I learned in business school to actually run a business. And then <laughs> I also, so that was a long time ago though, and I haven't been in the corporate world for a long, long time. And then the uh, random fact I like to make stuff and I take my hobbies very, very seriously. So uh, about two years ago, I started welding school. And last summer I graduated from a full-blown welding program. So I'm a certified welder on top of that. Not for a living, I do it for hobby and making stuff and artwork. But uh, I always tell people I'm an MBA welder and they always give me weird looks, but I think it's good to be able to think and do things. Um, so that's kind of like the, that's just kind of a little bit of background about me. Um, and what we're doing, I don't know, do you want me to just jump in here? Where do you want to go with this? I, I want to ask a question before we really jump into it. Sure. What is the secret to having a 20 year plus marriage? I married up. Let's start there. Um, I was a dipshit when we first got married and uh, she made me a better person because I wanted to be a better person. But I, I, I guess I don't, I don't have the answers, but I can tell you what solved a lot of our problems. I think a lot of people have a problem with conflict resolution and I think in, in a general respect and expectations. And I think that's what kills most all relationships, business relationships, marriages, boyfriend and girlfriend. So uh, if you want to hear this random tidbit, what we've done is uh, one, if you look at the things that kill most marriages, um, infidelity, abuse are obviously the top, but, but financial disagreements. You know, and usually one party tends to be worse than the other party when it comes to money. And uh, so, and I'm the guy who liked to spend money. So it wasn't my wife, my wife's a cheapskate. So she doesn't like to spend money on anything. And my wife's really smart. She's a trained medical doctor, does really well with her day job and, and her life. And so, but early on, um, uh, we, we figured out, we, we set up some basic ground rules because we realized we were struggling with things and not really seeing eye to eye. And we found that, and, and people think this is crazy, but back in the day, we, we set up some basic rules. Um, one, we said, because money was, you know, I was the guy who wasn't great with our money back then. Now this is, I don't know, probably 18 years ago. So 19 years ago, just understand this is, you know, a long time ago for us. But what we said is we started off as saying, okay, if you're gonna spend more than $25, check with the other person first. 
That was one rule. And this is back when we didn't have any money. So my wife wasn't a doctor then. You know, I, I was just a, like a, you know, worker somewhere else. So um, we're at a very different financial position then. Um, and, and then another rule we had <clears throat> was basically is we said the our spouse, the other person in the relationship has 100% veto over what we do all the time. Doesn't matter what it is. And so, and people are like, what? And I said, you have to trust your partner, by the way. So you have to pick a good partner if you're going to do this. And I, we think it was like the ultimate, um, it's kind of like a, it's like you're giving power away and it is. So it'd be like something like, and I'll, and we don't have many disagreements over this. So what happens is, so like, for instance, I want to skydive. My wife says that's an unnecessary risk. And while we have, we have four kids, so we have four minor children. She's like, I don't think it's a reasonable risk considering you have four minor children. One, maybe we wait, you wait till after the kids are grown and we can read really talk about it. But at this point, we, well, you know, but I mean, this is a mutual agreed upon, like we agree to these yeah. terms, right? So, so here, here's what it is. So she says, I don't want you doing that. She also says, I don't want you playing golf either. Um, and so, but other than that, there, there's a, there's been basically, no real things that I can't do in my life. And and, and that know, goes we, both ways too, right? It goes both ways. And so, um, but what we find is that you're respecting the other. So one, why that I think that was a good idea is that one, you have a, you have a conversation about things. It's not like I'm going to do something or not do something and the other person gets pissed off, right? I mean, that's really common, right? I'm just going to, I'm a man. I can go stay out if I want. Then he breaks his leg and then there's a fight and, you know, whatever else. Um, but I think ultimately it opens up a conversation and then one, you could persuade the other person. So ultimately, instead of arguing or fighting and, and taking these really difficult positions and stances, you have a dialogue. And I have to sell her on an idea or she has to sell an idea like I'm less risk adverse. So I if you know, so I'll give another thing, crypto investment. There's a lot of things I would throw money at just because it's a gamble. But I think it would be kind of interesting to look at. And she'll be like, no, I'm Dr. No, I, I don't think that's a good use of our money. And some of the times when I have persuaded her, we've lost a little bit of money, you know, so I understand, you know, there's risk aversion levels. But the good thing is I trust her judgment and usually it's very sound. Um, sometimes she trusts my judgment a little more. So it just depends on the situation. But I think if you do those things, um, I think you actually will have a better relationship. Um, and then like, even now it's really funny. Like, you know, I can get by with any, I really, I have enough money that if I want to do something, I can find the money to do it. I mean, we're in a good position in our, our lives and, but we still have a hundred dollar allowance every month. I only get a hundred dollars to spend. And so if I want to buy something that's above a hundred dollars, I have to, I have to save my allowance. My wife never spends her allowance. And this is how funny it is. Cause I get my hundred dollars and it's out the window, right? It's usually bought. I usually buy gun parts or something, right? That's my problem. I got a gun. Yes. <laughs> there you go. but, but here's the thing though. So listen to this, this is no joke. So, but I mean, we still get like birthday money and relatives and Christmas money, even at our age, we, you know, usually. So like, if I want to, I like to build a gun or two a year, it's like a hobby. I build guns. And so it was really funny. Cause like, I'm always just like, Oh honey, can I borrow against next month's like, allowance money i want to buy this new scope or something right that's usually what happens and like it was like it was like two years ago or three years ago my wife's like i'm going on a trip like what do you mean you're going on a trip well one of my co-workers retired to hawaii i want to go visit her i'm like oh wh when are we going she's like you're not going do you have any allowance like what do you mean she's like, oh. i'm not joking my wife <laughs> no shit this is true story my wife literally went to vacation left me home with the kids for four you know, four kids for like a week and a half <laughs> went to hawaii without me on her own allowance and said well if you have allowance you can come but you know it's got to be on your allowance <laughs> but you don't no it's because she doesn't spend last remember last month when you asked to borrow against it for the month yeah you don't get to go it, it was hilarious. <laughs> and, and, and you know what? And I totally was cool with it. It was just funny. And I'm like, you're going to Hawaii without me? She's like, yeah, I saved my money. You don't. <laughs> so, oh, oh, oh. No well, shit. And she like, it was really funny because she like never, like she like doesn't, one. she doesn't even know how much money she saves. She's like, she never spends money on anything. And they're like, how much? Like, I don't know, a couple of grand. I'm like, what do you mean a couple of grand? How do you have a couple of grand? You don't even know. I don't know. It's just it's in my she's thing. frugal. She's frugal. Yeah, pretty much. Oh, yeah, I got, I, I, you know, I got a thing where it's like, yeah, I need to build an, another gun and 
I have you know. the same thing with mining rigs. It's like, oh, I want that new mining rig. Oh, that was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> what about the last? What about the? You know that ant? You know, I really, I got an ant miner seven, but though that that you know that nineteen E or whatever it is or right. whatever. Yes, yeah, right. nineteen Pro. Yeah. You know, I, so. I, want, that, that, I, want, I want that. I want that. What's miner? That that what's miner M plus thir- uh, uh, M thirty plus plus. <laughs> Yeah, so so I don't know. I don't know if I have the solution. Like, I mean, we still fight, and you know, we still piss each other off. And you know, twenty years in, we just kind of know that we can both be assholes at times, and we know that we'll stop being assholes in a couple days, and then life's good. But but uh, she's a really smart chick. I really like my wife, and and I don't know a lot of people that after twenty years say they still really like their wife. And I mean, she's still really hot. By the way, she was a so not only is she a medical doctor, but she was a professional Disney on ice skater for a year too. So and she still looks like a Disney on ice skater so it's all good <laughs> roll it up it's all good <laughs> roll it up the like there is, first there 10 minutes no, in that's there awesome is no regrets <laughs> no, all right, no regrets, regrets. No let's regrets. roll right into it <laughs> no regrets. i want to ask this straight off the bat because it's off on, it's on everybody's question why crypto and guns <clears throat> oh that's that's really straightforward um, it's actually not a quick answer. So, like, I get a lot of shit from, you know, Maxis. Why not use this crypto or that crypto? Um, why I'll use crypto s- at all? Right. Yeah. Oh, well, let's start there. Um, <laughs> there's a, so, in the United States, there are several industries that, for political reasons, but not necessarily legal reasons, are basically uh, basically locked out of all third-party payment options. Um, and so, guns is one of them. Um, I always I always go on my big spiel on how we did market segmentation and, and why we chose this industry. Um, but the, the bottom line is the gun industry right now, it's they're basically are considered a red flag industry by the finance industry. So, you know, we talk about, you know, well, oh, just, you know, set up PayPal and Stripe and your business is good to go. Right now, if you're an, a lawful FFL gun dealer, right, you go through all this background check, all that headache. And then you go down to your local bank or credit union, they won't give you a checking account. Oh, and in fact, not. a good ch- about half, actually more than half of the national banks will not even do a checking account for a licensed gun, gun dealer. Yeah, they and won't they do it for so guns or uh, marijuana get, businesses. Yeah, they, they won't, well, yeah. All right, well, there's about seven industries that have this problem. So it's like pornography. So, man, you messed up my whole spiel. So <laughs> you asked me the question. I got a whole spiel about this. But, but the bottom line is the gun industry is basically for political reasons um, considered under Operation Choke Point from 2012 to 2013, the government went and decided to go after sinful industries and try to target their financing. And those industries would be things like gambling, pornography, payday lenders, cannabis, guns, um, and people that cater to the unbanked like refugees and immigrants. And so um, so a couple of reasons why we decided to go. So Tusk, Universal Settlement Coin, um, when we decided to go after mass adoption, we said this. In the United States right now, most people do not have a problem that crypto solves. In fact, crypto creates more problems for most people than it solves. And, and people get pissy when I say this, but if your idea of marketing is hassling the Starbucks barista or the, your Uber driver or your grandma and tell them to go use Bitcoin for something, one, they're probably going to hate you. Two, you're creating more stress for them. And three, you're not solving any problems. And we said, if, you know, just from the sheer marketing side of it, if you're going to go for mass adoption, you need to start with people that what we say have a recognized problem. And in the United States, most industries and people don't have that. But there are industries that do have one and they're all distasteful industries to somebody. And so what we did is when we decided to, you know, we started as an ETH token and called OCC and then we rebranded and built our blockchain and rebranded as Tusk. Um, but before we did all that, I wanted to go and look at, you know, how are, what are we going to do? What problems are we going to solve? Why create a new coin? Why, what problems are we going to solve as Tusk? And we said, we want to solve the mass adoption problem. And we wanted to develop basically a strategy on how we close that last mile of crypto adoption. And, and really what that means, how do we stimulate people to buy things with crypto? Right now, most cryptos are just speculative assets. And we want people to really use our coin. Um, and so we said, if you're going to start, you got to start with one of those industries that some, nobody likes. Now, OK, so how do you choose which industry to start in or which industry should you not start in? So I do have my own political bent and, you know, even though I'm fairly libertarian on things, there's certain things I just don't want to be involved with. 
Um, cannabis seems like a really interesting option, but the problem is with cannabis, it's still federally legal. And if you're out there trying to, you know, support financial transactions into something that's federally illegal and heavy, really heavy with cartels, one, you're probably going to create a lot of potential regulatory risk for your product and your project because you might be doing money laundering for cartels accidentally or inadvertently. Um, and so the regulatory risk of starting with cannabis didn't make sense for us. Um, but then we said, okay, I'm a gun guy, right? Used to have a little gun business, a little side hustle project. So I already liked the industry. Um, pretty knowledgeable about the space. Um, but on top of that, uh, we did some market research. And, you know, the gun industry is about a $50 billion industry when you take all the different, you know, pieces of it into account. Um, just direct guns and sales are about 5 to $6 billion a year. But you start getting into body armor, accessories, optics, scopes, all that fun stuff. It gets up to about $50 Ammun- billion a year. Ammunition. Well, uh, yeah, it, it's huge. Voice. But then of all those distasteful industries that we kind of just mentioned, right? Guns is the only ones that's constitutionally protected. Okay, pornography, yep. you know, pornography might be First Amendment. Some people make the argument, but there's still obscenity <laughs> and that's still state regulated. But right. guns are pretty much the only, it's, it's a giant industry and they can't even use PayPal. They can't use Stripe. They have a hard time getting bank accounts. When they can get a credit card account, they're paying between three and 6% credit card transaction fees. They have no chargeback appeal process because they're considered high risk. Um, and it, it's just one of those things that I think is a real important, but the industry is under attack. They call it the war on guns. And we all know that if you know anything about the industry, they, they've been struggling the last few years, especially. So we yep. figured um, it is controversial. We knew that going into that. Um, but we also figured that's part of the reason why they have a payments problem. It is because they're controversial. Um, but again, in the United States, why would you use crypto and all the accounting hassles and all the pain in the ass and all the learning curve if you're a business owner when you could use Squarespace, you know, Square, Stripe, Venmo, you know, PayPal, any of these other options and you get, you know, cheap rates on your, your merchant processing. Crypto doesn't solve any problem for you. You're cre- in fact, it's going to create more work for you just handling the, the accounting for the taxes. So if you're going to start with mass adoption, you've got to start with people that have a problem. And that's why we decided to go down that road. And that is why we chose guns as the Very, first market, as the right. first market. So our, 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 we're, we're, we named it Tusk, the universal settlement claim, because we're not going to stop with guns. That's not, the, that's not the goal. It's where we start. We have like a 10-year plan. You know, I don't know. You guys all look a lot younger than me, but you know, twenty, you know, six years ago when Amazon started, they were a bookstore for you know five, six years, mm-hmm. and all they did is work on books. And you know, there's a great video um, interview with you know Jeff Bezos about why they chose books. He went and did market analysis. He wasn't like some book lover that was just passionate about books and wanted to get in there. He went and said, "Look, there were four hundred thousand plus SKUs of books across all genres. It was ripe for disruption. We decided to start there, and then they worked their way out." Tusk is going to start with the gun industry, get traction, focus all laser focus, all our marketing energies, efforts, and business development efforts into one space, create synergy, create an ecosystem, hopefully, where people don't have to, you know, cash out from Tusk, you know, but can stay in the system. So if you have enough retailers using it, then the distributors are going to want to take it, get enough distributors, take it, manufacturers, take it. And to me, once we get to that point, and maybe that takes five years, I don't know, you know, I'm not in a hurry. Um, But once we do that, then we can focus on taking it outside to other industries. And by then we'll be probably a very big project if we're successful. And then we'll be able to have great case studies and say, look, we did all this in this industry. It'll work for you too. Huh. Okay. That's so phenomenal. I like that. You you did say that you started out as a token, so I'm assuming Ethereum token? Yes, ERC20. It was ERC called 20? OCC. I'm like spilling stuff all over my Amazon slot today. Uh, <laughs> but, so you were a ETH token at one point, we and were. you actually made your own blockchain, or did you fork? Yes. Well, we forked bit, we forked BitShares 2.0 and then modified that. Um, so which the word BitShares. BitShares, okay. And so we are a delegated proof of stake blockchain. Um, and we felt that, you know, by the way, it took us a year to sort out all the different things about governing and marketing and all the pieces that we went into how we designed this. And and we spent a lot of time sorting things out. And we are and we did do things differently. And we did a lot of little things differently because we think it makes more sense. So 
Um, we, we decided to go with BitShares because they had one on-chain governance that we really liked. And we felt that if you look at a lot of the proof of work blockchains, if they have a problem in their communities, it just fractures the shit out of the project. You know, BCH, BS, you know, V and, and all these things. And, and we felt that kind of turmoil can kill a project. And that doesn't make sense. You need, um, we felt we, it, it would be better to have a more elegant way to deal with conflict. Remember the marriage concept? You know, we people need to be able to sort out their disagreements without blowing everything up and taking their ball and going home. Um, we felt on-chain governance with a voting proposal process was the best way to do that. Um, we also then, I asked, I like to ask questions. Um, how do you, how do you market a decentralized community project like a startup. And so that was kind of an interesting rabbit hole to go out. But what we came up with is this thing called the marketing partner. So, uh, you know, we looked at how a lot of projects were marketed or not marketed is more likely to the case. Um, and so what we came up with is a term limited and elected vendor that works for Tusk that gets elected by the, the committee and the community. And then it actually serves a three year contract. It gets a small sliver of the block rewards to grow Tusk like a startup. It opens its books every year and writes a report and says what we're doing. What do we do with the money, so to speak? Um, it can be fired. Um, they do not get any say over governance. They get no say over voting. Um, and that way, it's not mired in bureaucracy. Not every single thing needs to go through a proposal that way, which is some of uh, like Dash and some other projects. They do have a similar mechanism where they do voting and proposals, but it's like micromanaging. It's like management by committee, which is really horrible because you can't execute a good marketing strategy if you do that, especially because like, for instance, if all your master nodes are developers, what the hell do they know about marketing and what do they hell? And so if they're making the decisions about marketing, you might not get a really cohesive marketing strategy implemented and executed. Um, so we don't know any other blockchain that's structured it this way. Um, and we think it's the way forward. Um, and then a little other things we did that were a little different. So think about this way. like. Who pays, who pays the fees in a normal crypto transaction? The miners, usually. Well, the, generally the, you know. I mean, well, in my the world, sender. I, mean, I, I usually deal with miners. Uh, so. The person sending it. Yeah. yeah right, the, but the sender, yeah. how does it work in credit cards? The person who's, every time somebody swipes, they get yeah. charged a fee. Charged then the yeah, vendor, the then the vendor, the merchant gets charged for using yeah, their, the their software. Thing. And that Seller merchant, base. that that merchant passes that on to their customer. So Correct. I mean, uh, it's like I've I've ran businesses too, where it's like you're you're dealing with all these different payment structures, and every one of them that you accept as a business, you have to pay, you have to pass that fee on to your customers. It's not going to be all oh, your you get this like specific cost of what it's going to be. He just takes an average of what it takes for the whole year of transactions and then dices it up what each customer would need to do analytically in order to make them profitable on that fee. Sure. Well, a couple of things that we said is like, one of the you know hurdles is inertia. Whenever you're dealing with learning curves, when you're trying to you know, change a process or, or do something new and innovative, you want to reduce the number of things that are different or new for those people to like adopt it. Um, so crypto has the fees reversed compared to normal payment methods. And, and there's reasons for that. Usually it's to reduce spamming, right? That's one of the reasons they do that. But what we felt is that we wanted to reduce that hurdle. So with TUS, actually on a sale transaction, the seller pays the fees like a normal credit card. Uh, one of the other things okay. that, because we built it for retail. I mean, that was our goal in mind, the way we structured this. Another thing that we did that is probably a little different than a lot of projects. And I used to own a retail store too, like brick and mortar. So I, I had actually set up my own point of sale. So I know what a pain in the ass is to yeah. integrate stuff. <laughs> and trust me. And, and so, but all that stuck in my head when we're doing this, like, man, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that either. Why do they do it this way? I wouldn't do that, you know? And so that's, you know, I think like an entrepreneur, not a developer. Um, and so we also said, okay, you know, when we were originally an ETH token and back then, I don't know if you guys remember the F coin debacle when it clogged up the Ethereum network two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that, that was, by the way, that was the, that was the breaking point for me for, you know, moving on and getting off Ethereum was that exact. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. We can't, people can't even afford the gas to move our tokens. It's just, it's just absurd. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's and, absolutely and it, terrible. 
So I call it, you know, it's like the Uber surge pricing. I think part of the problem is with most of, especially with, you know, again, to reduce spamming, right, is that you have this congestion pricing for, you know, the mempool congestion and things like that, depending on the blockchain. So you don't have consistent, you don't know what your transactions are going to be. Like the actual transaction fee varies so much. And then the end users have a hard time knowing how much to spend to get a transaction fast, you know? So we said that doesn't make sense to us. And, and we believe that that would be another one of those usability uh, impediments to adoption. So we said, okay, we're just gonna have a flat, like credit cards, we're gonna have a flat transaction fee, only half a percent for a sale. Now transfer wallet to wallet is way cheaper. It's like 50 Tusk or something. It's really, really tiny. Um, but for a sale transaction, we said, look, half percent transaction fee, flat rate, you know, a flat fee. So every time you know, if you sell, a retailer is gonna sell a gun with Tusk, you know, that's what you're gonna pay for a fee. And that makes sense because they already know that with credit cards, it's gonna be three to 6% or whatever that is. So if, if, if it's $50 to send a transaction today and $10 the next time, I mean, you, you know, you don't have to deal with that. We have consistent pricing and we built that in as well into our blockchain because again, we wanted to be as basically as familiar as far as digital transactions and payments goes for the people that are gonna adopt it. We wanted to make it simple. Um, and so we, we did a lot of these little things along the way when we were kind of building Tusk and because we want to make it as easy as possible for people to use it. So the, 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 you know, it's like everybody's big th thing is it's like, OK, if you, you can make it easy for somebody to utilize it through the network, which means that they've got to have a little bit of knowledge about crypto to begin with. But what about somebody utilizing it like they were just put plugging in a Square app and instead having it to where you're actually allowing them to get it back into their bank account like they would if they were using a you know a credit card comp uh, software company where you know you're linking up your bank account and just right on in. So you know we're early and so right now um, we have a pretty solid roadmap on where we want to be. So for the next 12 months on, we're not focused on anything but building infrastructure and liquidity. Uh, we plan to late 2021 to really start doing our major onboarding of retailers. Um, but I can tell you a, a lot of this stuff is stuff that we talk about on a regular basis. It's right. how do you abstract as much as basically how much do you, how, I mean, it's focused, how do you like, how much do you abstract away the crypto stuff? Because people, it's hard. Crypto is complicated, and and we're trying to make it as simple as possible for people to do that. And every time we're doing something, we're thinking about, you know, at least I'm thinking about um, how do we make it as normal and as easy and familiar to people to reduce right. that, you know, that kind of learning curve. So there's a lot of things I would like to do, and I wish I had a magic wand. I would do it right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and and part of that is a growth process. Like we are, we're low. We don't have a lot of liquidity yet. So and and. That's that's what we're building out right now is like we got to get that liquidity up mm -hmm. before we can even you know access some of the tools and networks like moon pay or what have you to have some of that the ability for people to buy uh tusk really easily so one of the things that i don't want to be dependent on is i don't want to be dependent on third-party centralized exchanges in china <laughs> for yeah. our network right i because i don't think that's great a good thing for our retailers and, and I view our retailers, even though we're a decentralized project, I don't own it, there's no company, there's no LLC, there's no CEO, right? Tusk is a protocol. Um, I'm just, you know, one of the guys who came up with the idea. And, you know, we're, I have lots of ideas on how, it, how I believe Tusk should look. And yes, it looks to me as simple as Cash App. It's simple as me, you know, as being able to buy Tusk right on your website through a widget and then convert it from a credit card. And right. we are identifying potential partners to make that happen. Um, and I think over the next 12, 18 months, we'll have all that dialed in. Yeah, that'll that'll be that. your the, the biggest hurdle that you would have for like that merchant adoption side of things. Well, it, it's interesting because uh, we have a pilot program going on right now. And before we ever started coding, we talked to people in the gun industry. Like, you know, I spend more time going to gun conferences like SHOT Show and uh, Gun Rights Policy Conference, NRA Convention, things like that, than I actually do to crypto because I believe that's our industry. And, and I'm trying to, you know, ingratiate myself and get to know and introduce myself to the industry. I'm not trying to just build a pump and dump coin. It's like, I, right. like I, I don't want to do staking. Like everybody's like, dude, just do staking in DeFi and you make a bunch of money. I go, dude, I don't want to do staking. You know, do you know why I don't want to do staking? There's a big reason for this. It's for the fact is I want people to use our coin to buy stuff. 
and staking incentivize people not to sell it. Yep. And I don't want that. I don't want people to view it as a speculative investment only. I want people to view it as money. And if you're getting people, if you're going to pay people to not spend it, that that's counter to what our mission is. And so a lot of people that have staking rewards, they're basically cutting, if they want to be money, they're cutting themselves off the knee, in my mind. And you got to you got to align sense. your incentives with your mission. So, you know, how do we close that last mile of crypto adoption, right? So what we're doing through our marketing partner is we're already, we're road mapping and, and mapping this all out. But what we're doing is we're going to create all the pieces a retailer needs to properly incorporate safely and smoothly crypto into their operation. Yeah, like literally a phone number awesome. that can... So now this is as simple as using something like TaxBit and partnering with someone to handle the tax accounting piece, um, mm -hmm. creating explainer videos on how the retailer can use this stuff, having a tech support line. We're going to be doing a lot of things and we're working on, we got a lot of interesting ideas on how to approach some of these problems in a decentralized way. So we're even talking, again, this is just early shit, right? But this right. is, we're talking about building out um, a CRM, a decentralized CRM to support retailers because we know we need tech support. We know we're going to have right. to deal with this in some way. Is there a way that we can create decentralized tech support, much like Mechanical Turk or Fiverr and incentivize people to handle people's problems in a decentralized manner all on chain? So we're looking at things in an interesting way because we know this will be a problem. Um, you know, being able to atomic swap is going to be important. We are really pushing for building out liquidity pools. So, for instance, we're talking to the Zap protocol people about maybe being one of their guinea pigs for liquidity pools for Tusk and actually serve as a decentralized oracle for Tusk instead of being our price being only um, dictated by CoinGecko or CoinMarketCap. So we're looking at all these things because we want to have a rock solid foundation that retailers will be, you know, feel comfortable using. But we have a lot of pieces we have to put together. Now we know what those, we think we know what those pieces are and we're gonna bundle all those pieces up and then provide them to the retailers. Um, in addition, um, we're looking at how we think we can close that last mile of crypto adoption is by basically having our retailers incentivize their customers. We wanna give the educational materials to the retailers and then they sell their customers on using it. So for instance, um, one of our clients is a body armor company, Citizen Armor out of Provo, Utah. Um, and they're offering discounts for people to pay them in Tusk. And in fact, the first sale of a good or service in Tusk happened about a month ago and it was a couple sets of body armor were bought with Tusk. And so, so think about it. If, if you're already paying somewhere between three and 6% on your credit card purchases and you have a huge chargeback problem, and you still have to wait, you know, a week for your, you know, ACH to, from Visa to come back to you. And if we only charge a half a percent to use Tusk, it eliminates the chargeback and you get paid instantly. It's worth discounting maybe one or two or three percent to your customers. And the economic, that's what I sell. This is how I deal with low tech people in the gun industry, right? Half a percent transaction fee, no chargebacks, and you get paid instantly. That's all I say. How do you explain what a decentralized project is to somebody? Oh, I don't go into like a censorship resistant, decentralized, no owner, blah, blah. That scares people. I say we're like a cross between a nonprofit and a co-op. Oh, they get that. You got to be able to speak to people on their level and, you know, and no one gives a shit about decentralization. You, you know, the five of us here, we give a shit about decentralization, right? Um, if I go to someone who's worried about losing their merchant account because of politics and I say, look, if you run through a WooCommerce plugin that we're building, and you're hosted on a safe hosting and you're using WooCommerce, you can't be shut down by an activist bank. Well, they like to hear that. They don't care about censorship resistance, but if you say, we're not gonna shut you down because we can't, they like that. So you just gotta lead with what that. makes sense to them. Are you, are you working with Shopify as well? Because uh, you just said WooCommerce and my interest peaked. <laughs> well, WooCommerce <laughs> is open source software. So if you host an open WooCommerce on your WordPress site, you don't have to deal with Shopify at all. And in fact, no, Shopify two years ago, shop, they fired. Well, this is why the gun people understand decentralization and censorship, right? They don't think of it in those that word, that wording. But um, Shopify, their CEO came out two summers ago in 2018 and fired all their gun dealers off of their platform because they're anti-gun. Mm. Last summer, uh, Salesforce, the CRM software, fired all the gun dealers for using their sales software. <laughs> Seriously, go look it up. Wow. Uh, and, you know, they can't use PayPal or anything else. So the gun industry is very much aware of the canceling culture that we have out there. 
uh, and they have been for several years now. So again, it goes back to that recognized me, me, problem. Me and Mikel actually know about the sh- Shopify censorship too, because yeah. we both try to sell mining. Uh, it wasn't really like straight up mining equipment. It, it is, but it's PC parts. Use use PC parts. So um, yeah. and as we're cryptocurrency miners, and we we promote that, and you know we promote and we I said it. I know I put it in mine even after I changed it. Long story. Uh, so it was like graphics card. The graphics card it was for sale. List that it was used for mining. We're aware. It's been re-thermal pasted. You know, here's what the hash rates are. You know, giving people good information that they would be like, oh, okay, so I can go buy this card and this is what it would do. And uh, Shopify banned us from using their payment system um, because Apple Pay does not support uh, cryptocurrency. They okay, 100% no, no, cryptocurrency mining is yeah, what it was. Cryptocurrency mining, but they don't know so because cryptocurrency at all. And even though I didn't even have Apple Pay enabled, they're, they're partners with Apple Pay, so therefore they can't facilitate my services. Anymore. Well, they they could, but they you couldn't use their payment structure, right. which meant that you got hit at a higher percentage rate, which was there goes profits. <laughs> it was a whole extra. It was like a whole extra four like percent, and just from them. And every and all the other gateways that you had to go through, costed, like you know, six al- six percent or 3% more, three percent more than they did. So really, you're getting hit with six percent extra that you weren't just because they don't yes. like they it's don't like that high, you don't have that. And I was high and risk. it's a high risk. Yes, it's exactly how how the guy so, how support li- listed it. They said it's because it's high risk. That's how they list it. Like, hey, here's an interesting crazy. thing though. You know, it's a nuts, though, but here's a funny, you want a funny exercise? Go look at all the third-party payment gateways for crypto and go look at their terms of service. Guess what? Go look at coin payments, terms of service, and look at what they prohibit using it for. Oh, yeah, guess what? Guns is on the list. So even though it's crypto and unstoppable, because of their under, because of coin payments and some of the other third-party payment providers, because they're underlying bank relationships. Yep. Yep. They won't do high risk stuff. So, yes. for instance, if you try to use coin payments now, I'm not sure how how good they police it, right? But I can tell you with normal merchant accounts, they police it pretty damn well. Um, but I know if you look at their terms of service, that they can cancel you any time for a whole lot of things that I mentioned, like crypto and can or you know guns and cannabis and pornography. If you're using coin payments to handle that, they'll they can cancel you at any time, which is just like you know PayPal and Square and Stripe. And so one of the things that we're coming up with, and, and it's coming from community members, it's not even our team that's doing it, but there's people that are working on a completely open source WooCommerce plugin that isn't owned by anybody. And then you just download it to your site so you can accept Tosk. And that way, you know, you, there's no way to censor that. And so we're, we're doing things, and there's some legal reasons too. There's a lot of weird gray areas in the United States um, about that. Uh, right. Is you know if you provide the gateway, are you now a third-party payment provider or not? You know, and so we got to be. We're, we're trying to be careful and as lawful as possible, um, so we yeah, don't that is fall a really into. Good, that is a really good catch on that one because I looked at the same thing. Um, I was looking at the same situation for setting up my store, and I was like, if I just accept cryptocurrency like through myself, I become the third-party gateway. But it seems to be a gray area, and then. If you do it, it seems to be that you ha- you are then held liable for everything. Yeah. So if you accept, so if you, th- so this is the gray area, and I've talked to attorneys, and they say it's a gray area. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the problem. It's it's really, you know, you can try it, but make sure you, you understand you can still get in trouble. So yeah, it's, it's kind of like this. If you download an uh, any app and you just want to accept crypto, and it just you download an app, uh, it's not really a problem. There's no legal issue with that. But if you now write, so for instance, let's just say you create a payment gateway and that you put out there as open source, but you don't make any money on it. You just throw software out there, not a problem. People download that, you're not providing a service. You just created software in the beginning. Now, there's some gray areas about this interpretation and I'm not an attorney. But if you, for instance, even put out a payment gateway, but yet you add to yourself a small transaction fee every time someone uses your gateway. Now that's what like coin payments and some of their other, that's some, that's the model, right? They, you still, they, they tack on an additional fee for providing the plugins and whatever. If you do that, now that changes things a lot legally 
because you're now providing that payment interface and taking a piece of the action that changes it legally. So you got to be careful about that. So a Tusk as a project, we're trying to avoid that. We don't want to, we don't want to take a piece of that, but here's the thing, but, and this is that gray area and this is what sucks about crypto. Cause there's still a lot of gray areas out there. There's still a lot of regulatory risk, you know? So if we create a payment gateway, but, and throw that out as open source software, but don't take an additional fee. However, our network still gets a transaction fee because that's built into the software. Is right. that now a third party? Now, do we are we a third party payment gateway or not? And and that's one of those things that's like, <laughs> and that's what the lawyers say too. We're like, could be, depends on how much it piss somebody off that day at the SEC or FinCEN, right? So we got to be careful. And but as a project, we do think about those things. And even when we launched, right? Um, so two and a half years ago, you remember everybody's like, it's a utility token, You're right? Remember those days? Mm-hmm. What horseshit. <laughs> but it was really, and it was, and, you know, I was new to crypto back then, but I started talking to lawyers and I had lawyers tell me, you know, and there's big law firms pushing SAFs and, and this utility token nonsense. And I said, I'm not a lawyer. We didn't do an ICO. We never sold tokens. We never sold coins ever. Uh, we released our initial coin token supply for free via faucets. So anybody could take them, you know, you had to go up and download them kind of like, um, not Neo. Was it Neo? Did that? There was another project that did it very similarly like that. Um, and we found out that, you know, we never sold tokens. So we never hit that point of the Howey test. But I'm kind of a, you know, tenacious guy. And I said, well, government, if there's a gray area, they're going to look to precedents from some other technology and see if there's an overlap. So I said, is there any risk? I asked me a question. I asked myself a question. Is there any risk with giving away free coins and free tokens? And everybody's like, no, it would be no problem. If, well, guess what? This is, uh, I, I, and uh, I looked it up. And during the dot-com boom back in 2000, 2001, the SEC prosecuted, I found at least four instances where they sued internet.com companies for giving away free stock. And why they did that is because those companies were creating lead generation databases and collecting email addresses. And the SEC said that was valid personal information, a valuable information, and that's an investment of money under the Howey test. Huh. And so we were thinking about doing the exact same thing. So guess what? We didn't collect any personal information from anybody. We didn't even, uh, you know, we didn't collect where they're from. We didn't do any of that stuff. We didn't take any information, no email addresses. So, you know, fast forward two and a half years, it was actually very smart thinking that we did. We weren't trying to be dumb and try to, you know, scam people. But um, we're probably one of 50 or 60 projects now that can be legally traded on an American exchange because we're not an illegal ICO security. Nice. That's a good way to do it. Interesting way to go about it, too. People gave a shit, though. Like, oh, it's giving away. It's just a shit coin. And I'm like, I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> you know? You know? And it's funny because, you know, I haven't made any money off this. I've never sold a coin or token personally ever. And so, you know, in fact, my wife and I put quite a bit of money personally into the project. And, you know, it's been because we really believe in what we're doing. So, you know, I could have pumped and dumped two years ago and walked away with a bunch of money after about six months in. We already had enough volume and price that, you know, I could have made some money. But, you know, that's not my goal. My goal is to actually get be one of the first products that really gets some mass adoption. So that's kind of what our focus has been from day one. And it's like an ego thing at this point. I really want to make this work interesting yeah, so i like it from so, a interesting sorry chris uh ahead. from like an interesting gunny standpoint uh how would you handle situations like polymers uh 3d printed you know lowers stuff like that how would <laughs> your token handle those yeah, there you go. <laughs> so you're all right. So you're an awesome. You're an awesome. There you go. See, you see the, the serial first number of the show. <laughs> oh, I I, I, do you see the serial number? No, 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 no. Okay. Does that answer the question? Um, so I our mean, token it answers so- the question of like, do you like it? Uh, <laughs> I will say it this, doesn't so- answer the question of does Tusk deal with that. Yeah, because that's uh, a huge, like, Because they're about to come down on them. Issue um, so, about stuff like that. I mean, so 
I got polymer oh. 80s and stuff like that. So I good man. I completely understand that. Uh, so I will we'll start off with that in the United States right now. There is no regulation from the ATF on how a gun needs to be purchased. You can use anything correct. to buy a gun. So there is no regulation regarding that. Um, and we don't change any of that. Like a lot of people, especially people who are not gun people or Europeans, by the way, as a tr- <laughs> being in this space, being controversial, trust me, when I talk to Europeans <laughs> about the gun thing, they usually go off, they, they, they go off their gourd because they hate guns. <laughs> but it's kind of interesting. But they ask the same question, right? Um, we don't change any of the background checks. The, the point of sale, I mean, we're, we're a payments process. It's no different if you bought them with Bitcoin, a check, cash, a gold bar, silver bar. That in no way affects regulation on how guns are transferred legally, lawfully, you know, how whether or not people have to get background checks. And in fact, you'd be far better off to do things illegally with cash than you would with Tusk. Because right now there's a digital paper trail. I would, yeah. if I was really concerned about privacy, I wouldn't buy a gun for you know crypto at all. You know that's nope. not the point. And so uh, I just like to get that out there. It, it makes no difference, right? I mean, uh, most people buy crypt. You know, my, most people buy their guns on credit cards, right? Most people that buy guns are white people that have money. Guns are expensive, and they tend to buy them. White people tend to buy everything on a debit card or a credit card. So uh, this doesn't change any of that. This just opens up more options for payments, especially for smaller mom and pops to do online sales of like gun accessories. Like I said earlier, body armor, you know, it's we're, we're, we're around the whole tactical industry as our first markets. Um, but yes, uh, we are focused on gun retailers and the gun and tactical industries and the shooting sports industries, but that's not just the FFLs and things like that. It, it's, it's, it's tactical stuff. It's, you know, it's gonna be for the whole industry really, um, but it doesn't affect any of the background stuff at all. So people still, regardless of the payment method, you still have to get a federal background track if you buy a gun from a, a, you know, a gun store. So Tusk is purely a payment processor. It doesn't track uh, anything on the blockchain, no shipping, tracking, or anything like that. Nope. It's just purely a payment processor. Correct. It's just payments. And and so, and in fact, personally, like, like I don't own it, right? Like this is a community project now. When, when we went from, you know, we, we built our own DAP to swap from Ethereum to Tusk. And uh, when we were a token and once it was interesting because we did have a business entity set up as a token. Um, But once we went and we felt we needed to do this, once we went live with our blockchain and then, you know, the committee was elected and the block producers came in and we went live, I, I gave up all control that I had over the project. It is now completely I don't have any say over governance other than my own votes. Um, like anybody else. So that was hard, by the way, as an entrepreneur to let it go, because after you'd spent two years plus building something, they're like, oh, no more power. Um, but uh, but one, there you're are one of us now. Dude, it was hard. I'm telling you, in some days it's frustrating. <laughs> it's like my it's like negotiating with my wife. Like, like I can I can often get my way, you know, I'll, and I'll be honest, right? Like I, I'm the, the, the as ugly as I am. I'm the face of Tusk. Like it was one of my, I was one of the co-founders, but I'm the extrovert. I'm the guy who's out here doing the interviews and I can't get anybody else on my team to do shit as far as talking to people, right? They're just like, no, I'm, even my wife's an introvert. So I'm the guy, this is the, uh, this is my job. So everybody sees me and just, um, but because of that, and because I'm a co-founder, people generally in our community take my recommendations when we're trying to do something because one, I'm in my telegram group every single day and I have been for two and a half years. I'm really accessible. You know, you go into a lot of these projects, you can't get, you know, try to get Dan Larimer from EOS and BitShares to talk to you anywhere. Good luck. Won't happen. You know, and so I think, you know, any of these big name, try to get, try to have a one-on-one with Vitalik, right? Like on just on Twitter or on Telegram. It won't happen. You won't, these guys aren't accessible. We are accessible. So usually people like what, you know, I mean, all we're, we're focused on making this a successful project. So most of the time I do have influence over the network and I do understand that but I don't actually physically control it. Um, right. Now, uh, there are several projects in the space that are trying to do transactions and ownership records, and they're trying to create blockchain databases of ownership. I know three to four projects that are trying to do that in the gun space. I don't think they're gonna get very far, uh, and I don't support that. In fact, uh, I'm a heretic on some of this stuff. 
I, I, this is my own personal bias, not Tufts bias, but my own personal bias that um, I don't believe there's certain types of data that I want put on blockchain. I don't want to put medical records on blockchain, for instance. I don't want to put gun ownership records on blockchain. And I do yeah. that because blockchains are just software. And guess what? At some point, somewhere down the line, 20, 30 years from now, you know, levels of encryption will be broken. They'll be broken by quantum computers or something. And I'm building a project that'll hopefully last 100 years or more, right? So I got to think about, okay, what if what happens now if we built this centralized database or even a, you know, a blockchain for NFTs of ownership or what have you, right? And there's people talking about that. And then in 20 years, all that data gets hacked by a government entity. Like, you know, who's, who has access to quantum computers? Like, so if you're going to crack, uh, you know, SSA, you know, SHA-256 or something, it's probably at least right now on the horizon can be done with some kind of quantum technology. Well, there's only, you know, a couple of companies no, that... Yep. Can... Only like, there's only three, three? maybe, maybe guess, that quantum computer, the guy could even come close to touching it and you would know where it's coming from. It's going to be a government or state actor that has access to that because they can yep. they're going to be the ones that can afford it and like i said yeah, I, so to me right now gun ownership records believe it or not most people don't know this but technically at the federal level right now it's illegal to make the federal government is not legally authorized to make an ownership database of gun owners they don't have that information so a lot of people don't understand this um that information is decentralized already in analog form at the gun level at the gun retailer level yeah. right now um so think about when you get a background check sorry so let's just say you walk through a store this is the general process to get a gun from a dealer in the united states walk into a gun store say i want to buy a gun pick the gun out they go okay fill out this big long form don't and don't screw here's it seven, up here's seven sheets of papers you know here's, 44, a, here's a pin don't mess up you don't mess shot. oh you screwed it up throw this out we'll do another one <laughs> you know because i always and i always answer one of the questions wrong because they're they're worded stupidly but the form is a 4473 and it's an ffl form for a background check so what happens is you fill out this form and you have to give them all sorts of id and prove who you are um, and then they take that form and they call the they either call state number or the federal number depending on the state because some you know you have to hit nicks um, some people just call directly, depending on the state, call directly to the ATF. Some people go through their state, which then pings that same database. And then it just says, Rob wants to buy a gun. Can Rob buy a gun? Yes, Rob can buy a gun. Here's your confirmation number, boom, that's it. And then you pay for the gun with whatever payment method you want. Hopefully it'll be Tusk. And then that database, usually that form is saved in literally a notebook or a binder. It's called a bound book. Um, they do have digital versions of that, but again, that's at the retailer level, literally at the store. Um, and so if the ATF wants to find out where a gun went, let's just say they picked up a gun at a crime scene. There's a serial number on it. They call the manufacturer. Manufacturer says we sold it through the RSR, which is a big distributor. They call RSR. RSR says we sold it to so-and-so Joe Bob's guns at this store. The ATF will literally walk to that store and say, Pull, give me the 4473 for this individual and then they'll know who that person is. Now, it's pretty efficient. They can do that within a couple hours, typically, in almost any country, any state in the country. I mean, it's a really fast system. They do it all the time. But, uh, you know, that, da that data is isolated. So if I buy a store in one part of Salt Lake City where I live, and then uh, buy a gun in another store across the you know, city, those stores don't know that I bought two guns. So if one of those stores gets robbed, or what have you, and they steal the bound book because they want to know who has guns, right? They won't. They only know that I have one gun. They won't know that I have this other gun. And, and to they me, don't, they don't share information. They don't share information. And so, to me, that's already decentralized, <laughs> as much as it possibly can be. And and to me, putting those records on a blockchain, besides all the technological problems, what if you lost your keys and you want to sell your gun? You know, and all these other just normal problems that people do with losing their keys. I can see all sorts of problems with that. But um, to me, I think in this case, putting gun ownership records and same with medical records, putting those on a blockchain are a centralizing activity, not a decentralizing activity. And I see no benefit. And I also see a potential huge long term risk with doing that. And I don't think it makes sense to do that. I like it. Is that a, I got uh, lectures over <laughs> yeah, two okay. things for you. Two, um, bef uh, before, you know, we wrap up here. Let's get the link to your Telegram so we can put it in the description down below so people can join it for you. Sure. Um, um, second, let's say I want to buy a gun. 
and I want to use Tusk. Well, I don't have any. How do I get uh, Tusk to purchase a gun to support the network? So I appreciate that. So currently right now we are traded on five exchanges. None of them are major yet, and we're working on that. We have three more listings in process right now. So we're building out our, like I said, this next 12 months, we're focused on just building infrastructure and liquidity. Um, the biggest exchange we're on is Altilly. Um, the nicest exchange, they're gonna hate me, the nicest exchange is Altilly. Um, but we're on Probit, which is the biggest exchange, then Altilly is the, I, I like the customer service of Altilly. And I've worked with their devs for a couple of years now because they, they supported us as a token first and then they still honored us when um, we moved over to our blockchain. So I like Altilly a lot. Um, we got a couple more in the works and, and that's just kind of an ongoing process, right? Just getting liquidity and stuff. Um, and But that's the main place right now to, to get Tusk right now. I go to Altilly uh, or Probit. Okay, all right. Uh, are the faucets still going on? No. I, I saw I saw on your website, when I, I w- did a little dive. I went to the website and saw that it was already just, you had distributed across like the whole world and like 58% went to Asia, like, how hard is it to get into America, you know, in compared to Asia? Like, why is Asia so easy to get, you know, that many tokens out there? Well, here was the interesting thing. So we did not block it, but the, remember, this is two and a half years ago. And I had this question come up in an, another thing I was talking to earlier today, why there wasn't more in Africa. And I said, we marketed it globally. Like we didn't prevent anybody from accessing the faucet. It just seemed at the time, two and a half years ago, that people in like Indonesia and the Philippines and, and Vietnam were like all over like small, you know, right. faucets and micro caps and they just, they work it. And I think that's part of it. I just think that those guys, there was just a lot more communities. I know we showed up on a bunch of like, you know, airdrop type websites that were just like, here, check out this one. And I think that's where that came from. And it was just like, that's just how the original distribution went. At this point, we don't know where they are. I mean, we not only have we, we've been traded for a couple of years now, but you know, doing the swap as well, we had we had no control over where we well we weren't tracking any of that stuff. Um, one for security sake, right? I don't want to invade someone's privacy, but we we weren't making you know we had to be careful when we did our swap too, because we had to shut down trading of our token before we launched you know the new coin. So there was a weird new position because. If you have a token and then you just trade it for your old coin and they're both still trading, you just did an ICO. So, you know, like a lot of people, you know, did ICOs for ETH or Bitcoin, right? Well, it's still an ICO. So we had to totally shut down uh, our, our, and we couldn't kill our contract. By the way, that was a pain in the butt. Um, but we, we actually got all the exchanges to delist it. And we even got either Delta to delist it of all things or fork Delta to delist it. By the way, that was not easy. I had a badge of guys for like two months. Um, but, uh, so we actually were able to stop trading completely, um, on all the exchanges that we were listed on before. And then we couldn't, um, and then we had to like basically totally deprecate the token before we could launch the trading of the new coin. So we were a continuation not an ICO. I mean, there's all these legal things you got to think about and how you do things um, because we don't want to, I don't want to break the law. I don't want to go to jail. And and one, there's some practical reasons. I, I don't look good in those jumpsuits. And two, the fact is from the project standpoint, if you get in trouble with legal stuff, that's bad for the project. And, you know, and we want to avoid regulatory risk as much as possible. Excellent. Excellent. Tell us about your podcast and like how that even got started and why. Oh, practical matters. Um, so a long time ago, I used to do a startup story radio show back in Denver on a radio station and going back about 10 years ago. And I really liked doing radio stuff, though. I got a face for radio works out. Um, but two and a half years ago, when we started doing this right after the ICO boom. There was all this ICO money floating around and it, just trying to get an interview was ridiculous. Uh, I couldn't get like you know, even small podcasts with like no followers wanted like 500 bucks or 5,000 bucks. Or I had someone quote, like, you know, almost $8,000 to go on their show. They had like a thousand followers. And it was funny because I've like at the time had hundreds of thousands of followers of my Twitter account. I'm like, you're, I'm going to bring more people to your podcast and you're going to bring me to my project. But, um, we, but since we didn't do an ICO, I didn't have money to pay for that stuff. And so I said, um, I hadn't done podcasting in years. Um, but I knew how to do it. 
And I really hadn't even been using my Twitter account at that point. I literally let my Twitter account go dormant for like five years. I got sick of Twitter. I was one of the, I, I joined Twitter like the first year and I built up my following from my radio show a long time ago. So like to me, I was just like, eh, I got bored with it. But then um, when I found out that the Twitter world is kind of, or the crypto world's kind of on Twitter and all these podcasts were like wanting to just, you know, take, break people over the coals. I said, you know, why don't I just do my own podcast so I can help promote my own show and I'm not going to be a douchebag and charge people to come on my show. And so the, what I do is I wear my hat, I put a little ad for Tusk in front of it, and that's my monetization. I'm just doing it as an in-kind for the project because I believe in it. Um, but I also really find that I, I'm very selfish. One, I love to network with people. And if you invite someone on your show, they'll come on usually and you can talk to them. So that's nice. And I get to meet really cool, really smart people that are much smarter than me in this space. And I learn from them. Uh, and, and that's probably the main benefit I get out of it. And and two, I get to promote cool stuff, you know, and I know how it was two and a half years ago. I mean, we're still by most metrics, a really tiny project. But, you know, if there's some good tech out there or someone doing really cool stuff and, and they don't really they're not good at marketing or they're just having a hard time getting someone to hear them. I want to promote that because I think it's good for the community. And. I always said I wanted to be the change, you know, that whole kind of, you know, kumbaya thing. I want to be the change in the community that I, I, you know, want to see. And so to me, I don't charge. I don't monetize. I'm not trying to make money with my my podcast. It's purely, you know, for selfish reasons. But I also like to, you know, support other people to come on my show and tell me what they're doing. I like it. I like it. All right. No, um, your, your your hat. Where can somebody get one of those hats? <laughs> so, so you don't have a merch store yet? So there is a Tusk merch store that's not ours. It's just a community member set one up. And like again, we're trying to do that. Like um, I have no control over that. Um, they don't have hats in there yet. So it's interesting. One of our co-founders, like two years ago, did a, a run of twenty hats. And this is just one of them. We don't have hats yet. So, all right, I've had like two requests for hats today. So I'm going to talk to the merch guy and tell him to go get some hats figured out because I'm getting more <laughs> people asking about the hats. Um, and once they come in, I'll send you guys some. Rock on, rock on. As That's you can see, awesome. we're all hat guys. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. just trying to hide my, my graying bald head. So I'm um, so right I, there I, with I, you on that one. You ain't that much older than me. <laughs> I'm, I'm 48, so I'm, I'm probably older than, than you think. All right, so um, I, I just found the uh, Tusk merch store. So I'm going to go ahead and do a quick share. And there's hats. Are there hats now? Oh, I guess yeah. there are. I haven't been on there. I told them to do hats the other day. So there you go. There's hats. Thank you. We, I, I didn't even know they had those on there because he didn't have those a couple weeks ago. Good to yeah, know. So there, there's hats. <laughs> <laughs> and, and here's the thing, right? Like, you know, we could, we could have set up a store for merch too, right? And then made money off that. That's... But... I'm like, that's not our job. You know, this is a community run project. Like we're not, I mean, we're not here to make money that way. Um, and so that's kind of the, the thing. It's like, I encourage people to make money on Tusk and to help grow Tusk. And it gets people in the community excited about it. I want people to own, I want everybody to own it, right? It's like, you know, this is your project too. You know, Just, you are an owner. We do the, we do you know what that sounds like guys? Say. That, that sounds like community-driven development. Where have we heard that before? <laughs> DCA, DCA. We I did mean, it we backwards. Got, we have tons of we have tons of people. Um, you know, if uh, well, we need to have you join our Discord. But in our Discord, oh, absolutely, there is a oh, whole... I hate Discord so much. I know. <laughs> it's like no, like don't a, make me do it. <laughs> it's, it's like a love hate relationship. You know, but, but if but you we guys have, we have a community, we have a community spot. So you know you. Have, Someone that wanted a meme section, so we put a meme section in for them. Someone wanted a specific spot for sports, put in sports, a trading challenge, a uh, good read. People want to read some books, uh, 3D printing. Uh, you know, so we have 3D printing spot, and people have actually posted and made, you know, DCA <laughs> logo SDL files. You know, and just yeah, somebody's cool laser community. printing our our uh, DCA, yeah. you know, coin design right there <laughs> yeah, so, you know, cool. community driven things like that is re it hits home for us because that's what we love to do it is hard to be honest i'll tell you this um as an entrepreneur i'd much rather have a bunch of employees that i can just say go do this and the downside right. there's downsides to this by the way development doesn't go as fast as i'd like it to and some days it never gets done and that's frustrating 
but every one of us has a day job, right? Like there's not enough money, you know, here to, to make a living off of. Now, workers can get paid now and that's great. So um, as we get more liquid, it should be easier to get people to come work on the project. So if you know any developers wanting to work for a cool gun related crypto project, let me know because we definitely need help. Um, and we just need even front end help, but I mean, this is my job. Like, you know, you know, this is what I do, but I'm not a developer. So I can't, but I also can't do it all. You can't build everything yourself. You need to have a team and a community. Uh, and, yep. and, and I can't stress, it, it's hard because you got to convince and persuade people. You can't force them. And, and so some days that's frustrating, to be honest. And these are the downsides for community projects. Um, you know, we're not well funded like a lot of these other projects are. But the good thing is we do have money in the bank. And so um, uh, we're in a really, if we were a startup, it's we're in a really good position because um, some of the supply didn't swap. And so the excess supply that didn't swap got put into the community reserve fund. I don't have control over it. Anybody can put in a proposal and the community can vote on it. But we have about 14% of the total supply now is in the reserve that can be used for marketing and paying developers. Um, we have a working product. We got four people now, I think, in our pilot. We have no overhead, we have no burn rate. And if we were a startup, I would invest in it because just from the fact that we were sustainable now. Um, we have a full section of block producers. So if people are into mining, we don't have mining, but we do have block producers. Um, they're making money right now. Uh, and I think as the, we go forward and grow, there'll be more block rewards to, you know, to share among the community and more money to put into the pile. So as we become more liquid, we plan to, you know, one, I'd love to hire some full-time developers somehow, if possible. But one, we really get to put out a lot of money back into marketing to growing the project. And so I'm really bullish on where we're going just from the fact that, you know, we were able to just reinvest these, you know, these coins back into the project. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited all, all the way around. I mean, we're in a very good position. In my mind, the hardest things are done. Now it's just let, let's just take this across the finish line. And, and that's more of just like what we're doing here today. Right? Just trying to help get people to, to hear about us and, and see what we're doing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure, rep Her, recognition yeah. and all that good stuff, for sure. <laughs> yeah, and anybody have any questions? Or anything else that wants to be said? Come on. For you anybody in the live ball. chat, now's the time to ask. <laughs> you, can, you can give me a hardball <laughs> on any time. <laughs> um, how do you become a, um, a black producer? I mean, what are, what, are there any real requirements in order to be a black producer? So to be a block producer, it's technologically not hard right now because our our, um, our our blockchain, when we pulled out a lot of the smart contract and the exchange and all the kitchen sink stuff that BitShares into it, it's a really low overhead blockchain. It's fast. Our, 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 our block times are three seconds and our average confirmation times are about two and a half seconds right now. I mean, it's fast. And, That's and faster that was important. than people could pull change out of their pocket. <laughs> Pretty much. So to be a block producer, um, a lot because, you know, to, in a delegated proof of stake, you have to be elected to the position. Right. You actually don't you you and and that's there's a whole whole different type of security based on that alone. And so um, so with us right now, I mean, some people are just running them on an instance of a cloud store, uh, a cloud hosting. Um, so we have 21 block producers validating just like EOS does. Um, but what we did is we also have 79 backups and we incentivize backup block producers too. So we actually have a hundred nodes running at all times. And if someone's block goes down, the longest a, a block producer has been down is like about, about a day. And then people are like, do we vote them out or not? <laughs> Cause you know, and so it's like a self healing network It's actually pretty secure. It's pretty fun, um, but it's political. Right, because you have to run for office, and I have run for office in the past, so I know a lot about that. Um, and uh, so, for instance, my personal block producer is called Ready Rhino. Right, we want to stay into the Pachyderm family. So I don't know, you're supposed to laugh at that. That was funny. So Ready, <laughs> so Ready Rhino is my wife and my personal block producer that we run in the network. Yeah. And we actually, if you go to, I think it's Ready Rhino dot o n dot one, Ready Rhino dot o n e. Um, it's like a campaign website. It's like, you should vote for Ready Rhino, block producer candidate, because we do these things for the network or we're a founder of the network and things like that. So a lot of the block producers, if you go into our Explorer, um, they're, they'll have a website for their campaign website to say why you should support them as a block producer. And you actually don't even need any stake to be a block producer. You just need to get the votes. 
So I know for a fact that I personally, some people have given me proxy. So I have a lot of votes and I voted for people to have almost no task to be block producers because they've contributed to the network and I'm loyal, I'm loyal AF. And so to me, I wanna take care of people that are taking care of the network. And my number one priority is to make the network as robust, sustainable, and secure as possible. And I'm always gonna vote in the interest of that network doing that. I am not doing this for money. My wife and I make plenty of money with our day jobs. We don't need to do this, okay? We're not desperate, you know? To me, this is a really big long-term plan um, and play for us. We wanna see something and make something really, really awesome and change history. And, and I know that sounds really weird, but, and kind of hokey, but we really do believe that. And so, um, going forward, you know, I want to support people that support the network. Like, for instance, the the gentleman who runs the merch store, I believe, is a block producer. And, you know, the fact that he went through all that effort to set up a merch store just for us, knowing early right now that we're probably not going to have a lot of transactions. We're still super, super early with our project. So, I mean, and the earlier you are on a project, right, there's more risk. Let's just be honest. You know, the earlier you come into something there's a big chance it's not gonna work, right? Any business, you know, it's like 75% of all businesses fail within about five years, 50% in the first two years. We're at two and a half years already. We haven't failed yet. So I think we're in good chance or a good, you know, position statistically, but still we're early. And so if people are gonna take the time and support us, I'm gonna vote for that person to also benefit from the network because they're supporting the network. I love what, it. I love you, it. Do you happen to know the minimum requirements for being a, uh, to support the network? Is there like a minimum like computer requirement or, or are you able to actually like run it off of your PC at your house? Uh, I know for a fact that people are doing just that. Um, given right now what the server loads that we're seeing, um, most people are running just on a, like a very micro tier, you know, AWS instance. I know some people are doing that. Some people are doing other cloud hosting um, services that they're using for that. Um, I believe one of the gentlemen is one of our block producers is in Vietnam and he's just running it off of like his own personal server out there. So yeah, and, and right now it's still pretty fast. So as we start getting more transactions, of course, then, as server load you know kicks up we'll have to scale up but right. that's why i like the cloud server piece um right now we have a general recommendation which is just copied you know copy paste from you know bit shares but i can tell you our our load because we took a lot of um we took a lot of stuff out so to speak or you know and you know commented a lot of the code out that we weren't using a lot of the functions of bit shares like bit shares has a built-in exchange and stuff and we like we just we're not using any of that so it actually made it pretty lightweight and so right now there's just not a big server load. You could probably run it off a laptop. Oh, nice, nice, nice. Okay. Do you how many, I, I got one more question. Like how many gun stores slash manufacturers are already accepting Tusk or in how many states are you in? So right now we're just running our pilot right now because we don't even have our payment gateways built yet. We don't have our WooCommerce plugin. So everything's gotta be done manually. We have four people right now that are accepting it and we're talking to about half dozen more. Um, I think two of them, we have one in New York, two in Utah. Where's the other guy? Anyways, uh, I'll, I'll have to look it up. We got a few in different places. And because uh, I'm confusing because I've talked to a lot of people that are going to come on. We just haven't pushed it yet because they kind of want our plug yeah, One of them's a, a flooring company, it looks that's like. Mine. Oh, that's, that's me. yours? <laughs> that's me. I took that's a look at job. it. I'm like, oh, that's cool. That's really yeah. cool. <laughs> so, like, um, so a good friend of mine runs a CBD company in Colorado. He wants to take it. Um, we got a couple other FFLs in different states that want to take it. It's just we we're just not pushing that right now because we don't have the you know I want to get the the WooCommerce plugin done before we start like really pushing it because that'll be a lot more elegant. Right. Um, right now it's just manual. It's just it's just clumsy, you know. Well, but you know, well, not only that, it also says, hey, look, not only do we have this you know token that works or coin that works, but we have a working platform that you could you know hook it up to your existing website, and ta-da, you're in business. Exactly. You know, without that, ta-da, it's like, just wait a couple more years. Like, try to convince people of that. Yeah, I, I don't like, I, you know, it's like, there's always, there's so many chicken and eggs to this. Like, I mean, I'll tell you this, and this is stuff I didn't think about. How do you get a bunch of people that you don't know, or even people you do know, to set up a server for a, an unknown coin that isn't proven they'll make any money? Because they not only have to spend money for that hosting, they got to set it up and go through all that. I can tell you, this is a lot of work. 
to do that. You wouldn't believe how many people I've had to take to lunch, you know, say, hey, why don't you come on board, you know, kind of thing. I mean, there's so many pieces to this. It's chicken and egg, right? You can't have a blockchain very easily without block producers or miners. How do you convince those first people to come in? That's hard. It, it, you wouldn't believe all the crap you have to do to like make all these things work. Um, but the other, one of the other things that we're talking to, we're in talks with like a lot of big people and we've been basically beating the bushes for about a year now um, from the industry. Like I said before, we went and talked to industry before we started coding. And so we've been maintaining these relationships. So, um, and, and I can't release any names, but we're in talks with three of the top um, point of sale software providers in the e-commerce space in the gun industry already. And in fact, one of their, one of the COOs is actually in the block producer group already. And he's looking at setting up his own node. Um, and so we're talking to some pretty major players in the gun space. And if I, I think within the next six to 12 months, we'll land probably one of them. Uh, statistically speaking, I'm pretty good at sales. I think we're getting toward that, but they're just wanting to see us grow. We have to get more volume, um, you know, and that's all part of this process. So there's all these little chicken and egg things. But, you know, for instance, one of those point of sale providers has over 3000 gun stores on there using their software. So if we get integrated into that software, we now have 3000 customers that we can mine and start saying, OK, now accept us because it's already in their system. It's right on their it's right on their cash register. So this is, you know, and to me, E-commerce plugins gonna be good for the smaller mom and pops, but that's not how we're gonna jump. And that's not how we're gonna grow quickly. How we grow quickly and how we hack the growth is we get tied up with these relationships with some of these big point of sale providers that already have thousands of customers. And so that that's kind of our strategy is like, we know one or two of those will land over the next year. Um, and in fact, uh, a friend of mine is starting, a, he's got an MVP coming out and they're a well-funded project in the agricultural import space of all things. He and his partner, I know, each bought a significant share of Tusk off the market and, you know, on an exchange because they're going to use Tusk as a payment process. This has nothing to do with guns. And so, but until something like that lands, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do the Justin Sun, right? <laughs> announcement of an announcement. Um, <laughs> but we have, a, I'll just say this, that we got about a half dozen of those kind of size things that we're working on simultaneously. And I'm not going to blow smoke up people's asses. Like I'm not going to say, oh, it's coming soon. I'm going to say, look, I think we'll get one or two, hopefully within the next year. But you know, and, and that's not great. People want to get rich overnight, right? Everybody, that's what people want in crypto. But the fact is these, these big deals also take a lot of time. And we also are not ready in some ways. We don't have liquidity yet. We don't have all the on and off ramps set up yet. And so these big corporations and these big companies look at all that. And that's why like they're in our groups, they're paying attention. They take my phone calls um, and, and you know, they're like, hey, let's let's talk about what does this mean? You know, but the, like I'm, I'm I'm like I get an email from this. Well, I'm not going to say which company it is, but literally I met him in SHOT Show in January and I get an email from him back and forth with a question every two weeks since January. Nice. <laughs> it's like, and it's like, well, what does this do? two weeks and I respond, I don't hear anything two weeks. Well, what does this do? You know, it's like literally that's the, that's the rate that this goes. And it drives me bananas to be honest. But I can tell you again, we're not in a position where I'm worried about running out of time. We are totally, we have all the time in the world. We're self-sufficient. We're, we're sustainable. Uh, we got money in the bank. So when we get more, as we get more liquid, we're going to have money to pour back into marketing. And then it'll probably be like, you know, it's going to go slow and slow. And then you know, something will just pop. That's how these things work. Um, you know, to me, I'll be very happy if I can get my money out of it within two years, to be honest, you know, because I got a sizable amount of my personal income invested into this project just from time and, you know, actual marketing and stuff. We've had to, you know, how many conferences, you know how much it costs to go to a conference? You guys go to conferences? Uh, uh, not we, very often. Me and Mikel <laughs> started. Yeah, we've we've gone to a lot. <laughs> it's a, just going to a conference, especially a crypto conference, is thousands of dollars. It can you know? be. Sometimes you can couple couple hundred bucks on tickets, and then a couple hundred bucks just to stay for the couple of days. A couple hundred bucks a night, a couple hundred bucks of food a day. I mean, it's like you go to Vegas, and you know, yeah. if you want to stay at the hotel, I mean, it's like three hundred bucks a night. Have oh to yeah. Fly there. You're spending, you know, 25 to 40 bucks a meal. I mean, and you add that up over five days and then rental cars and, and all this stuff, it's, you know, three, four, five grand. But, you know, when you're trying to grow something like this, you got to go to a conference every month. And, yep. you know, and that's not even average. That's not even actually showing. That's just going. And, yep. you know, you know how many times I've had people like, um, 
say, you know, especially Maxis, right? They're kind of the worst. <laughs> but Maxis like, why don't you do this to Bitcoin? Why don't you tell, you know, gun people to use Bitcoin? And I'm like, okay. Um, I just spent, I went, you know, I went to six, how many conferences? Five conferences from like October to January. And I said, okay, so I've racked up literally like, you know, 15, 20 grand in just travel in conferences in the last couple of months. Um, where can I put in my expense report to Bitcoin for doing that? What do you mean? Well, who's going to pay for all that travel? Business development takes time. I have to take people to lunch. I have to make phone calls. I have to go to these conferences. Who's going to pay for that from, well, dude, it's just a community, you know? And I'm like, oh, so you're saying is I got to do all that for free for Bitcoin. Okay. So do you see the problem there? It doesn't make any sense. There, you know, it's like it's one thing if you you got a bag of Bitcoin and you bought it at like a hundred bucks or something, and you just you know, it doesn't matter because you've made so much damn money on it. But if you don't have bags of Bitcoin, but you're really good at sales and marketing and you want to grow it, how do you how do you do that? And I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you pay for it. Um, and so it's like you know, there's a lot of problems with that trying to grow a decentralized project if there's no built-in sustainable funding for that kind of activity. And I, I see that as a big problem, especially for these you know bigger projects out there. Um, and and I think over time, the projects that aren't actually trying to close that last mile of crypto adoption and actually go into these conferences and actually getting people on board with their, you know, really incentivizing end users, I think things are going to change. I think the top 100 in the next five years probably will have very few of the same players on it as it does right now. From what you're telling me, I think that uh, like, like how things are slow. I think that spike will happen with somebody like Colt or even Armalite joins the the Tusk network. I will yeah, I, all I will say is like, you know, we've had some interesting conversations in the last week and I, I I'm giddy about them and I, I'm not gonna say anymore. I, I will say that I've had some really, really interesting I think I, I put it this way. I've done sales like in my day job and, and I've been done sales for a long time and business development and networking. And I can tell you, you get a sense for when something's gonna go through. And, you know, we've had some interesting things happen in the last couple of weeks. And I'm just like, things, I would say this, things that I've been working on for months and months and months are starting to like, look very promising. And, and I'm really excited about that. So well, we hopefully we'll have some big announcements in the next month or two and, and hopefully we'll go forward. But yes, um, the long-term game is, you know, going through and getting brands to work with us. And and I didn't even get into the chari- charity functionality that we're looking at as a lever. So we're, we built in a charity function. Um, we haven't coded how we're going to onboard them yet. But currently, the block rewards, there's a split for charities. And we're going to onboard charities to the network. And then the, we're going to somehow, we haven't figured it out. I'll be honest, we haven't figured this out yet. Um, the, the plan is to have the community or the committee vote on which which type of charities will come into the network and get a share of transaction fees and so the idea with that is one uh and i've already i will say this i've already talked to two major gun related charities and they're already all about it um but we don't we need someone to develop it's just a low priority thing probably happen next year but what we're going to do is have it so that if you buy something with tusk then we can say look you're also supporting people that are defending your rights to to own that gun so it's kind of like this whole feel good thing what that does for us it gets us connected to major brands just on that space like some like firearms policy coalition and you know uh there's a whole lot of different agencies not i'm not even talking nra there's a lot of other projects like second amendment foundation um that are really doing some really really amazing work now in the gun rights sector and and believe it or not i think firearms policy does a lot better stuff than nra does for defending gun rights and, and i'm a big fan of what they also like gun owners of america so i've already talked to eric pratt from gun owners of america um he's already on board when we get that figured out so we got a lot of things that we're building in that are really gonna hopefully build loyalty into the the community um we're also going to be doing a lot of fun marketing so um the gun guys here are you familiar with black rifle coffee company and all yes Yes. (laughs) (laughs) okay i I actually sent a, a message to jt today uh because we're actually doing a poker tournament for charity And I wanted to reach out to him because he's connected with God knows everybody. And I was like, hey, how many veteran based uh, charities accept Bitcoin? I need to know because I don't have the resources. Like, could you help me? Um, So very few. 
Yeah. Oh, by the way, Wounded Warriors does. Are, by the way, Wounded Warriors is anti-gun. By the way, just so you know, I like to let people know that they don't like guns. Um, so, anyways, uh, I don't know if you know this, but Black Rifle Coffee is headquartered here, Salt Lake City, mm-hmm. and Evan Hafer is someone I personally know. And uh, so, oh. uh, the, the one thing about Black Rifle Coffee, I, I met Evan man almost five years ago now, before they were doing 100 million a year in coffee sales, and they've done some really amazing stuff. You know, one crazy. thing people don't get is that they created new shelf space for coffee. They sell coffee in gun stores. Mm -hmm. And so that's amazing that they did that. But one of the other things that they've done is how they got there is they did it with viral video. And so we're going to copy it. And so we did our first video um, called, uh, you got to read it, Bad Ideas. It's pretty funny. So to that end, because we believe that video is a very strong medium, um, we brought a filmmaker director on our advisory board. And so Tusk has a literal director um, on our advisory board who's helping us come up with all sorts of videos. So we shot the first one in March just before the lockdowns for COVID. And right now it's not super safe to be doing filming, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're working on a bunch of scripts. But if you go to the, if you go on, you can either go through Tusk.network and go um, through the community section and go look at our YouTube channel. And you can see our first commercial is called Bad Ideas. Let me know what you think. It's kind of funny. It it was designed to be funny. So we're going to do a lot of really funny video, but high quality, snarky, but high, you know, high production level stuff. So you said community and where? um, I think it's in the community section, but there, just look up our socials and it's on the YouTube channel. Uh, And in fact, I think, uh, where did I put that? If you go through, it's in the link in the chat actually right now too. I put a link to uh, the the Tusk uh, uh, let me, I'll double check to make sure I have the Tusk uh, social right there. I'll put that in double check right there. And if you go to the YouTube channel, I just put in the chat, um, you will uh, see our first commercial there. And it was pretty funny. So we're going to do a lot of that. Again, we got some ideas on how we're going to market crypto probably in a way that's not normal um, for crypto projects. But again, as you know, if you've any, you know, they've done like billions and billions of views of Black Rifle Coffee making these just snarky, funny videos but they those videos resonate with the gun community they resonate with the yes. veteran community so really the the market is the same as ours and so we already we don't have to reinvent the wheel from the marketing that way it works we just need to do it with our own project and we're going to be doing that. i would talk to Harmon brothers as well as you know trying to reach out to jt you know you know evan you know so i would try to see if jt could help you come up with the scripts the Harmon Brothers, they did um, the uh, Poop to Gold podcast, and they have their own YouTube as well. Sweet. And they, they're they the ones that are in, uh, responsible for the viral video that became Squatty Potty. <laughs> you know Squatty Potty's here, too. Yeah. In Everything's in Utah. <laughs> you know, people don't understand. This is a freaky place. I'm not from Utah originally. <laughs> it's a freaky place. Like, like if like politically, I'm not trying to get political, but if you look at, like, the bell curve... And you got left and right. You just got to push the wings way over because they're baddie on both ends here. Like we got literally commies running the Salt Lake City. <laughs> it's total communist. It's like really funny. They're like burning cop cars in Salt Lake City. We're like, what? Yeah, what yeah. is the problem? You know, it's like uh, it, it's pretty whack. But we have a huge gun manufacturer community. Um, three suppressor manufacturers are headquartered here. Browning's headquartered here. Barnes Bullets is headquartered here. Lots of boutique gun manufacturers are headquartered here because we're a very gun friendly state. We also are one of the lowest crime states in the country as well. Because oh, shocker. <laughs> um, and so you know, if you guys ever get out this way, um, you know, let me know. I'll take you guys out to the desert and we'll go shooting. Um, oh, I yes. also, if you, any, I don't know if any of you guys ski, but uh, we ski in Park City. So if you guys want to come out in the wintertime. And then every year, we've done it two years in a row. We have this thing called Off Chain, which is a crypto prepping conference. We've organized two years in a row now. And so that's kind of a thing we do out here as well, because we believe that crypto is part of self-reliance. We believe that, you know, decentralized technologies um, are important. So it's interesting um, the kind of people we have in the room. We literally, not this year, but the first year we did it, we literally had, um, do you know um, uh, uh, Jeff Kirkham from Black Rifle and and Ready Man? He's Mm -hmm. friends with Evan. So Jeff came out and literally was, we literally had like special forces guys teaching people how to do operational security about protecting their hardware wallets. It was hilarious. (laughs) I love it. 
Literally, it was. We we have all sorts of. It was. It's a very interesting mashup because you got on one side literally like software tech nerds and like special forces killer guys like all in the room, and all coalescing around this. You know how technology, uh, you know, makes people more self reliant and and things. And that's kind of that focus because there to me there's a huge intersection between decentralized technologies, decentralized payments you know, online privacy, you know, operational security problem. Think about, I mean, think about this. Nobody does this. And by the way, this is where I think most maxis are full of shit. I'll be honest about this. You know, they're like, oh, unbanked, the unbanked, everybody, dude, you know what? Can you imagine the security problems if half of America and had, let's just say that someone worked for 30 years and they, and they invested in their 401k and they got a half million or a million dollars in their 401k and everybody has like the equivalent, like a half million or a million dollars at their house on the little jump drive. Can you think about the security implications of that? I mean, it's huge, right? Like, and no one talks about that, you know, oh, so I'm gonna go put a gun to grandma. I'm gonna break into this old lady's house. She, we, we pretty sure she's got a, you know, big old 401k on her you hard drive. You can do drive. it for cheaper than that. All you need is a $5 wrench. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? And so the one thing that is missing from so many of these, I don't know, maybe they live in gated communities and they have their guarding, their Labradoodles guarding their Teslas or whatever it is. But, you know, the bottom line is, you know, crypto assets are becoming more valuable. And as they become more popular, as people start getting paid in virtual currencies, people are going to have a lot more wealth at their house in their person yeah, whether and, and but but you have the implementation of the banks starting to get or have finally gotten kind of a green light to get involved so now you're going to have cryptocurrency being held proprietary at the banks fdic insured i think that's very bullish to be honest it's I don't very like bullish it. but it's also bad news considering that the banks are still holding your keys yeah i i the I'm federal surprised. reserve the federal reserve just gave uh, gave some of these banks the green light to go hey you can do this you can be a custodial service on this and and i think and i and i and i see both i can see both sides of this right you're you know chris is right right this is hugely bad for decentralization oh, yeah. it's hugely good for oh. adoption yes it's a dual. It's, it's also, a dual-edged sword, big time. It's a dual-edged <laughs> sword, and and I'll be honest. Like, um, oh, one of the other companies that already does accept us, but I got to put them on the website is Safe Haven Vaults, and this is another option. I'm about options. Safe Haven Vaults are private uh, security boxes, and they're going to be a franchising across the country. Their first location is a super high security. I'm talking iris scan level shit here in Salt Lake um, and uh, they and they don't take there's no AML or KYC because they're not a bank all they say is no drugs and no explosives and they run drug dogs and uh, explosive dogs through there on a regular basis but they have no AML KYC and they don't have to because they're not a bank and so yeah, it's very interesting facility that, that yeah <laughs> so it's a storage facility but here's the thing it's better so but it's another it's an it's another way to custody and keep your um your crypto safe without having to give it over to a bank and give away your email kyc and give away your keys right. so so this is another thing that people should look at and, and i'm a big fan of what safe haven vaults you should look on just safe haven vaults um, I'm a big fan of them. Uh, I know the owner, really super duper guy. That sounds um, really cool. And, like and so yeah, and so they are going to be franchised. My understanding is they're going to be franchised. Man, if I had the money right now, I'd, I'd probably buy a franchise. I, that's how excited I am about it, especially with crypto assets, because it's going to be a secure environment that doesn't doesn't do AML KYC because they don't have to. It's not a legal requirement for private safe haven, you know, private vaults. Um, right, but they're holding it for you, box. right? No, the interesting thing is they don't have access to it. Um, so it's literally, you sign up, you can prepay. They accept Tusk. Um, they're willing to accept Tusk and other cryptocurrencies. Um, you literally, they just scan your iris when you go and sign up. They don't know who you are. Literally, I want an account, pay your money down. You can write whatever name on it. And what they do, which is interesting, is how do you do the chain of, um, basically chain of custody, say, if you die? So what they recommend, they got a pretty nifty system. They say, here's a card that you put on the outside of your box. So it's a locking box, you shove it in, it's just like a little, like a normal box slides in, and then they have another little door that has a key. And they say, here's a card, put this on the outside of your inner box. And if you, if you're, you know, you're, if you die or you don't come in and your box expires, we will drill the outer lock and then we'll call the person on that card. 
And so that's how they do it. And it's actually a really amazing system. And so I think there are going to be options in the future that do cater to virtual assets in this change. But I would never recommend, but Maxis don't talk like this or think about this shit. But guess what? I hang out with Special Forces dudes, right? They do think about this shit when I talk about the technology. Like, this is what they're going to worry about. This is what you got to worry about, like, from the physical security side. And so I like being around people that are smarter than me because they don't get crypto yet, but they get physical security and how they would go. Well, they, they, brain, they, they do the same thing we do, right? They go and brainstorm, like, how would I go and steal somebody's crypto? What would I do? And you do it right. through that thought, thought, you know, that thought exercise. Um, All the more reason for you to join the Discord so we can actually create that entire security section just for you. All right. I'll <laughs> drop a link and, and I'll jump in there. I yes. <laughs> <sighs> it's like I tried to get away and they pulled me back. <laughs> no, but seriously. Okay. The fact that he's, you're talking with special forces guys, you know, people that deal with security. Uh, I'm in security myself, but, you know, not on that level, okay? Right. Um, it's a, uh, it, it's what I think about all the time, you know, and it's nice to have somebody that's already made those connections, you know, and has those resources that can say, hey, look at this, you know, this right. is what needs to be done, you know, so it's not just digital security and, you know, internet security, making sure that your router isn't owned by the company that you're getting your internet from, you know, it's also physical security. So I love it. I love it. I mean, you I know, be. buying your safe before you go buy the bar of gold. Like, you don't yeah. go buy the bar of gold first, because what are you going to do with it once you buy it? Oh, yeah. and Everybody knows I mean, you just bought it, so what are you going to do with it? So I'm insane, like, when it comes, I'm paranoid about a lot of stuff. And like I said, I am not the developer, so you guys are way ahead of me and probably a lot of the tech stuff. But, you know, I know this, like, TikTok, right? You guys all love TikTok, right? Nope. Now, bad. the concept is bad. <laughs> That's a bad. Dogecoin. All bad. <laughs> Dogecoin. All bad. That's bad. That's, but tracking, here's the thing. that's tracking software. <laughs> but here's the thing, right? But but there's a huge market there globally, right? Oh, and yeah. so and so and I got to think in terms of okay, I got to I got to separate Rob's personal hat from the fact that I still have a job to do to grow Tusk. So, I'm going to be looking at TikTok, but this is how paranoid I am. I bought a dedicated, literally a dedicated mobile device oh, that I'm going to be doing this on. Good man. Smart, smart. <laughs> and, I won't even, and I won't even allow that machine on my network. I just oh, won't. Oh, I literally oh, got a yes. plan. It he won't does. even be on there. Uh, and I won't access anything else. I, the only thing I haven't figured out is how I'm going to get videos. You know, I might have to manually, literally manually, because I'm going to keep it basically air gapped from my anything else and even my other accounts. But I still need to be able to cross. So it's going to be a manual process. But I realize you know, that that's a malware. Essentially, TikTok is malware from what I've, you know, talked to. But there's, you know, but a friend of mine literally started his TikTok like six months ago. He's got two and a half million followers. I mean, the rate of growth, because it's such a heavily Asian market, it's, it's, it's got so many people on that platform that ignoring that is also on the marketing side, maybe, you know, not good. You well, know, Black Rifle and, Coffee's on TikTok. Yep. And uh, uh, Crypto Wendy's on TikTok as well. And she says that her TikTok's on a separate device as well. So you're thinking in the right direction. Exactly. And I, I, love, Wendy. I love Wendy, too. We've, we've talked before, too, a few times. Um, and so, yeah, it's the same thing. You got to just understand, you know, the risks and what you're doing. Like, um, you know, even on my own personal, like, because I'm, you know, very, like, we literally have security com- um, conversations with our team. Like for instance, I can tell you right now, um, I do. I used to be an open networker on like LinkedIn. And by the way, LinkedIn is probably one of the biggest social um, vectors for hackers now um, yeah. and fishers yes, in is. the crypto yeah. space. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting as a project, we get, a, we get people trying to basically attack us and scam us on a regular basis, like almost daily. And I've almost been scammed a couple times, like close. I'm, I'm really paranoid before I you know get to the point where I'm gonna send somebody something. Um, but they're getting really good. Like as a newer project, you literally have a whole group of SAMers that just want to kind of attack crypto projects, smaller ones. And they do, so what they do is they are, they're pretty smart. They know that crypto products, you know, may not have listing fees for big exchanges. So they'll literally set up a fake account of somebody who is, you know, affiliated with a large exchange. And then they'll hit you up on LinkedIn for a connection. But the minute you accept that, they get your email address. And then uh, we had one, and I'm not gonna say which exchange. Well, they were trying to, they pretended they were Bittrex, right? And they literally got to the point where like, this looked legit. I'm like, they spoofed the email address and and I 
I do my double dil. I do double triple diligence now. I'm pretty good at it. But and this is like a year ago, and they're like they literally sent me over full blown contract from looked like Bitrex. I mean, it looked like a legitimate listing contract. And we were on five exchanges. We were on nine exchanges of decks. I know what the, all that paperwork looks like. It looked pretty good. All fake. So before they came in, before we decided to pull the trigger and you negotiate stuff, I like to have face to faces with Zooms. But then I said, oh, um, I emailed you at your email address at through the, you know, the uh, actual domain name for your bid tracks or whatever. Um, can you reply to it? crickets <laughs> and then i you know then i reached out to bitrex to double check because just in case we were getting a legit bitrex listing a year ago that would have been really really nice so and they're like nope not us but that's where we are right now so you got to be careful out there and there's some very very credible looking you know scams even, out there even people i mean there's been multiple people in the youtube space that have been impersonated and people have fallen for it just because they follow them and they expect like them to be legit. So like, oh, they messaged me because they need something from me and I want to help them. And then you help them and it wasn't them at all. And you're just like, crap. Yeah. And then it, you feel that. Yeah, it, it's bad. And and I and you know what? This will get straightened out. Crypto will get better. People will get smarter. Um, it, it's a it's a time thing. It's going to take a few years. Um, but people are getting smarter to it and hip to it. And, and I think, you know, uh, things like the custody stuff, I mean, that's a big responsibility. People don't want that. I mean, even like losing your keys. I know multiple developers that have lost keys and lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in crypto. I'm like, you're a freaking developer. You know, you're supposed to know better. Right. And, and but people don't follow the basic, you know, OPSEC. They don't follow basic security protocols. They don't make paper backups. They they don't do a lot of things that they should because they just don't think about it or don't think it's that important. And then all of a sudden they're they're locked out or they lose their we'll fortune. Do it later and then later and then later and then it's too late. Yeah. Well, I mean, think of it like this. Can you imagine like if you, you know, let's think about a lot of retirees, right? Someone, there's a lot of people out there that have in their savings or retirement accounts that, you know, these people that have been working for 30, 40 years might have half million, million dollars they saved up their whole life savings. There's lots of Americans that are millionaires. I mean, believe it or not, but and most of them are just people that just save their money all their life. Um, and now you're going to say, we're going to put all that money into the hands on a little jump drive and you have to have the keys to it and you and you and these people are going to never lose their keys and when i know developers that should know better losing their keys can you imagine random just random folk out there you know now responsible for that kind of money no what's going to happen is people are going to lose their keys they're going to want government intervention to fix that oh, and, yeah. and so and so to me i think it's imperative that we come up with better solutions for how we interact with crypto so it's more forgiving and, and and i don't have all the answers on what those those solutions look like and and but i can tell you that as a project as we grow and those resources come available those are things i want to tackle those are things that i do want to solve you know is there a way to is there a system that we can create where people can deal with lost keys if we can prove that those they are the legitimate owner in some way I don't know what that means, right? I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if it's technologically possible, but I know that for adoption to happen, something needs to change. It can't be so unforgiving because right. the amount of money that is going to move into this space when the market, I mean, we're only at well, what half trillion dollar market cap or whatever, not even, you know, but when that market cap is in the 10 trillions or the 50 trillion dollar mark, when people have a, some, you know, a tremendous amount of their, their wealth involved, you're, and you have a lot more people coming in, you're gonna have to have different solutions. And I and I think that's where that custody at the bank thing is important, but I think the safe haven vault option is a really good one too. And, um, and we need to figure out some of those other solutions. But these are the things we should be talking about now oh, because yeah. we know it will be an issue in the future. I know these things will be an impediment to adoption. And, and, so you let's, can't, and you can't be a Bitcoin maximalist and think that Bitcoin will solve all of this. It's like, no, Bitcoin was never intended to solve any of that stuff. <laughs> Right. Well, look how much supply, like I can tell, you know, how much, how much of the crypto supplies that are out there on these blockchains are dead, are lost. There's no way to track it, but I can tell you even with our own project, cause in, cause we know because our project to swap was a manual process. You had to manually move your ETH over to an Omega address that we had set up and then, you know, set up an account and, and it was done manually and a good chunk of our supply didn't swap. 
it's either they got bored, they lost it. We know what we know, like 11, I think we figured out 11 or 15% of our supply was lost <laughs> from our token originally. <laughs> I mean, seriously, that's a lot of money, you know, out oh, yeah. there. Um, and, but, lost you know, if you, so if you had to, like, it'd be interesting to see if you had to take Bitcoin and manually move all the Bitcoin wallets had to manually on their own move to another blockchain. How much of that Bitcoin that's in circulation right now wouldn't move? It'd be interesting to know. I would oh, bet yeah. a lot of it. Think about all the dust that's laying around. All these paper wallets that have been distributed. Just think about it. It's all dead. Um, I don't know. It's just things I think about. But or people that thought that were dust and now is actually <laughs> worth the move. <laughs> it's no longer considered dust. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hmm. <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> Well, do we have any more questions? Because no. I, I, I'm completely happy and stoked, personally. Like, I can't wait to, to go create an account on Altelli. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. Um, I got to get one of those hats. Get, get, get one of the hats. Buy something from his store. I, Make I it am, worth his I while. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I'll give, you, I'll give you a little story. I'll give you one more anecdote thing because you're not asking me questions. I can talk all day. That's what I do. Um, so when we were OCC, um, uh, a lot of our members were in Asia and in Indonesia where they have elephants. And it was one, and the elephant came out of this is that someone said, don't ride elephant. Cause I said, I would love to go ride an elephant someday in Indonesia or whatever. It was just some random conversation in our community. This is how it came to be. Right. And then someone said, don't ride elephants. It, it's actually painful for them and not good for their backs or whatever. And someone in Asia and a couple of people like, yeah, it's actually kind of cruel to, to ride elephants. And it's not good for the elephants. So we made, a, we made this a kind of funny rule that in our group that you're not allowed to ride, don't ride elephants. Came one of our little mottos inside our group when we were OCC. And then one of the community members made an OCC logo with the elephant head that we have here. And uh, when we were moving along, we, we felt our branding kind of was sucky. We didn't like it. You know, original crypto coin. Uh, we meant original as in unique, not as the first. But, you know, right. there was some confusing about the branding. It's too long. It was dumb. There was another OCC out there on the ticker. So we said we when we were going to build a new blockchain, we wanted to do a new brand. And then we really liked the elephant logo because we just thought that part was really cool instead of our original O logo was kind of dumb <laughs> and and again i admit we make mistakes and and you 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 grow and adapt and and so we said well i want something with an elephant in it right and so um we we're i was thinking wrong tusk with a k and then one of our developers is like but i go it's got to be like an acronym or something and then we had a whole brainstorm he's like well how about the universal settlement coin with a c so tusk with a c and that's how the the rebrand came out so we kept the elephant from the original thing. It all started as far as the community. It was just trying to like be funny at first. Um, well, but that's how, I want to go ride an elephant. <laughs> so we don't ride an elephant. So that's where the tusk elephant thing came into being. And so it was kind of a, and it was fun actually kind of doing it that way. Yeah, having the community be involved and helping you you know, come up with ideas. That's great. That's that's how we love it. Me you too. Know. Where are you guys, where are you, by the way, where are you guys all from? Uh, California over here. I'm uh, Northern Illinois. Yep, smack dab in the middle. I'm in Oklahoma. So, hey. even DCA Adventures decentralized. <laughs> you know, uh, it was just a year and a half ago, and I was I was in Muskogee, Oklahoma. You ever been to Muskogee? Yep. That I have, sir. <laughs> that, that's that like I a have. cell phone dead zone. It was really funny. I entered Muskogee, and my cell phone stopped working. I'm like... What's going on? You just I went, went to, like, back local... in time. <laughs> well, well, what it was, it, it was literally at the city limits. I had like three, like LTE, and I crossed the city limits, like, boop, no bars. I'm like, what is going on? And I literally went into a phone store, and they're like, oh, they, your brand, it was, I'm not going to say who it is, but your cell company doesn't have a tower here. Yep. <laughs> like, and wow. It was literally, but but um, for my day job, I had to go to a tile plant. So there's a there's a tile, a ceramic tile plant in Muskogee, and I went and toured it. So, but I go to lots of weird places. Um, but I like Oklahoma. Nice. Yeah, it's an interesting place. Outstanding. That's for well, sure. If we got no other questions, uh, <clears throat> final thoughts, final words. Like, where can people find you, and uh, you know, all that good stuff. 
So me personally, I am always on Twitter and I'm easy to find. It's Rob McNeely. You type in Rob McNeely, you'll find me. So on Twitter, I'm at Rob McNeely. My domain for my podcast, which uh, is at robmcneely.com. And so pretty much in every social platform, I'm Rob McNeely. I, I'm just kind of doxxed, so it's not hard to find me. Um, but to find Tusk, um, you can usually find me through Tusk but or through my, my stuff. But um, just, just tusk.network is T-U-S-C dot network. Um, and even though network isn't our name, is our domain name, but you know it's hard to find Tusk for things. So it's just Tusk.network, and then on Twitter it's at Tusk Network. Awesome. Love and it. I appreciate Love that you like taking the time on your day to come on here and sit there and chat about the project. Uh, oh, really man. appreciate it. Yeah, it's well, a I fascinating really... project. I'm oh, really yeah. glad you came. Well, guys, I, I really do appreciate your time. Honestly, you know, it's like it's tough, you know, especially when I don't get a lot of money to spend on PR and stuff. I do appreciate you guys giving me and other projects like ours, you know, the opportunity to come talk. And, you know, I I got a big mouth, so I like to talk about this stuff, too. I'm really fired up about it. So sure and, the passion. You guys, <laughs> and you guys come on my show, too, sometimes. So, you know, like I said, I like people that are doing good stuff and, and you guys are doing good work and getting the word about a crypto and helping adoption. And I think that's real important. So thank you for what you guys do as well. For sure. We for appreciate sure. it. <clears throat> Any chance that you'll come on to our charity poker tournament? I don't know anything about it, and I really suck at poker, but I'm always open to make a fool out of myself and lose money, so let's let's do it. It's like, let's do it. Yes. (laughs) We'll try. It's set for August 15th. We'll send you the details after we're done. Absolutely. So, yeah. Can I drink beer? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Okay. Then we're good. (laughs) Rock on. (laughs) He's like, he's We either shoot something or drink something. Shoot something or drink something. I'm I'm, I'm pretty much there, so I'm pretty (laughs) open-minded. (laughs) <laughs> nice, right nice, on, right nice, on. nice. All right. But don't drink something and shoot something at the same time. That's dangerous. So I don't advocate yeah, yeah. for that. Right, I'm a safety right, guy. Right, so. right, Keep some right. of those hobbies separate. <laughs> <laughs> right. By the way, it's also like don't weld naked. It's another one of those good things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah or wearing yeah. shorts. Or flip flops. I've done that. Don't weld in flip flops. Just take and, and don't and don't think that you can just like close your eyes <laughs> while welding. What? What? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Oh, oh, real quick, I gotta ask, what do you think about those movies? And every time they have somebody welding and they're not wearing goggles, it's the dumbest thing in the world to me. No, 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 no. My favorite is when they're using the cutting goggles. Yeah, the cutting <laughs> goggles look, you know, <laughs> they, they they look a lot more steampunk. So people yeah. like the cutting goggles. Um, yeah, I, I I think Hollywood is. It's make believe. <laughs> now I can't say that I don't do dumb shit occasionally too, but I, I don't recommend it. But right. You got to bundle up. I mean, you you get sunburned, like you know, oh, yeah. if you're not covered up. So you got to cover up when you're welding. You get cancer. You don't want to get skin cancer. Don't be stupid. Wear a mask, you dirty plague rats. You know, it's like oh, yeah. <laughs> wear eye yeah. protection. We, wear a mask. We, we were telling this one dude, and he he he's like, oh, I've been doing this for twenty years, and then he come walking around. Where are you guys at? I'm like. You weren't you wearing your goggles, were you? <laughs> it's like you're yeah. dumb. <laughs> well, it, it's like you go shooting. Do you not wear ear pro earring protection? You know, it's like ear pro. Like it's like eye pro ear pro. Like, and I can tell you, like I still have you know tinnitus from my ears are always ringing because when I was younger I used to shoot without earplugs and I used to be in a rock band. So yeah, didn't wear ear pro. Guess what? My ears ring. Mm-hmm. It's gonna be like that the rest of my life. You know, yep, and so yep. I make my kids wear ear pro it's kind of a common sense thing but you know i also i grew up you know i'm older so like i grew up in michigan and back when i was growing up in literally the 80s um you know we did a lot more stupid shit like i grew up not wearing seatbelts, right like i grew up before mandatory seatbelt laws i remember them days (laughs) but well i mean in my it's funny because like so like like here's and this is true story and it's wrong but even my family you know i just grew up like grew up in a blue collar family right they just did what they could do but back in the day there was this like myth out there that wearing seatbelts was bad because you could get caught in a fire in the car in an accident and die and get burned up so a lot of people including my family felt that seatbelts were dangerous well when and ford had the gas tanks right there in the rear where you get Pinto. rear-ended and it exploded well, yeah that explains it. <laughs> it if you go back even further i mean I, i'm a i'm a classic car guy so i do classic car restorations and stuff like that 
Uh, nice. But you go back far enough, and you actually see uh, where if any vehicle that had a seatbelt in it did bad in sales back in the day when seatbelts were first being introduced in the 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. Because if they, if you had a seatbelt in there, it meant that your car was the not car was safe. safe. <laughs> I met You know what? I met Ralph Nader a couple years ago. Oh, that had to have been a great conversation. <laughs> he's, a weird, he's a weird dude. He's kind of That's old, what but, I heard. But, but, <laughs> come on, you got to remember, activists are all nuts. Yeah. <laughs> That's why critical people are all weird, right? We're all nuts. You know, uh, the, the, the cannabis activists are all nuts. Crypto oh, yeah. activists, we're all nuts. Let's just be honest. You're, you're early right. on. You're probably nuts. We're all nuts. Yeah. We're just a different kind of nuts. But uh, yeah, and so, you know, so I grew up in a much different environment. People didn't care about say So I was so in high school, like even for a time after high school, I had a job working in an alternator rebuilding shop. And I'm like literally bare hand, it's sticking my hands in carcinogenic, you know, you know, oh, yeah. my hands are bleeding at night. My brain's like, yeah, good, good for you. I'm like, my hands are bleeding. Your, your hands are manning up. <laughs> but, but, but it was like, hey, no big deal. And I'm like, I still like put antioxidant cream. I'm going to die from skin cancer on my hands from when I was 16, you know. Um, <laughs> but but life's very different now, right? Like, I, oh, yeah. I would never, like, and we were just, I, I will say, I think society's evolved, right? You learn. And, and smart people, you know, can change their mind with new information. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Now, I can tell you at my age, I still have ringing in my ears. And, and it was preventable. Right. And, and hopefully they'll figure out a way to fix that in the next 30 years or whatever. But, you know, why can't we learn from that? And I think it's like ear pro. Like, I, I, I hate putting goggles on when I'm grinding. Right. And I'm just like, ah, I don't want to put that on. It's like, I got to go across the room, put on a helmet. And I'm like, no, I wear goggles when I grind because, you know, what? putting metal in your eye is not fun. But when I was growing up, that's we. We did all sorts of reckless, careless stuff when I was a kid, right? But times are different now. And then I think, you know, just like being safe and proactive with your crypto is important. I think, you know, whether you're using power tools or driving or whatever, I think let's take that, you know, let's take that science and that innovation and tech and leverage it and, and utilize it so we can be a better society going forward. And I think ultimately people can do that. And I think we should, but that's a whole other conversation. And I'd love to talk about, you know, I want to get a 68 car and do a resto mod on a 68 Mustang. It's my favorite. Oh, uh, definitely. I actually just got finished up with a 66 Mustang uh, a month ago. <laughs> uh, do you ever watch Bitch and Rides? Yes. Have you ever seen that show? Yes, yes, yes. I, uh, I was in their facility uh, three weeks ago. Oh. They're actually, oh, by the way, they're in Salt Lake City. Yes, yes, yes. I, 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 as, soon as, as soon as you said <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's right. They're right around so, from you. <laughs> so, I, um, so I went and I, and so I had some fr crypto friends came up for Vegas to do an 80% build with me. And uh, so I have some jigs and stuff. And we did like the social distancing thing in my garage. It was pretty funny. We're like wearing masks in my garage and drilling out lowers and stuff and uh but one of my buddies knew their lead one of their lead guys over there and we spent like three hours over in their shop oh that's cool and got the full tour like backstage you know oh. kind of stuff oh, that's <laughs> awesome. they that's got awesome. an, and the and they got an amazing build that's in process it's a, like a, a pantera and i'm like yes like, and, and i'm like yeah, when I get a half million dollars, I, I'd love to have a coyote-powered Pantera. That sounds like a lot of fun to me. Mm -hmm. If I had to come up with like a crazy dream car kind of thing, it'd probably be a Pantera. My wife, you'd really like her. Not only is she a Disney skater, she's a medical doctor. Her um, her favorite car, she wants a Resto Mod International Scout Harvester. International Harvester Scout. So she nice. wants to do a obscure, a, a, an obscure car. Nice. <laughs> so my, my, it was really funny because my wife ran for city council when we were living in Colorado back in was it 2011, 2012, it was 2011, I think. And they interviewed her uh, like, what's your favorite car? It was just some dumb question. Like she's running for city council. They wanted all these weird <laughs> personal things. She was, like, I'm an international, she was like, I want an international harvester scout. And they're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's like and it's like funny because she like won a lot of male votes because of that it was really funny <laughs> everybody's like oh i want a mustang or you know some kind right? of normal she's like, like, everybody's like she knows international. Cars. <laughs> so but we're not normal so i mean again we're crazy because we're in crypto and but oh, yeah. it was really it was really funny because one of my businesses um you know i owned a liquor store in a really bad neighborhood we for a year we owned we flipped a liquor store of all things 
in Colorado. And it was in the worst neighborhood in Denver, literally. And literally we open carried pistols in our store. It was literally that kind of liquor store. And so my wife, medical doctor, running a register at night, while we were growing this little startup and then carrying a pistol on her side. It was really kind of a weird, like, just a position um, when we were younger. So I've got a lot of weird experiences, you know, um, just in general. But, you know, to me, it's like I, I still believe in this industry. I really love crypto. I want to see it work. And I'm hoping that we can be eventually one of those crypto products that help push adoption forward. Nice. And, uh, you know, I think we got a plan to get there. So we're going to mm -hmm. keep chugging along. If it takes five more years, it takes five more years. I'm not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Excellent. That's awesome. <clears throat> you know, you mentioned um, <clears throat> that car show and I was like, oh, I happen to know somebody. Um, I actually know Mark Towel from Car Masters on Netflix. So, cool. Yeah, and uh, I would love to do a resto mod of, believe it of all things, a DeLorean. <laughs> oh, you know I like I I like coke. Uh, I love those cocaine cars. Um, oh, right. <laughs> So I used to work. So I used to work in the auto industry when I was back in Michigan. So you know, I, I love cars, and um, and believe it or not, one of the reasons I went to welding school is because I wanted to, I want to eventually build my own car. So I'm like working up projects to and build my skills. So I started off like making weird implements for my. Um, you know, a rototiller. Then I bought a beat up tractor and modified that and built like weird prolows from scratch. Um, done a lot of landscaping. Now I'm doing a go-kart project with my kids right now. Then I'm converting a boat trailer into utility trailer. It's my next project. And then I'm probably going to go to a dune buggy. And that's kind of like, I'm learning. I want to, I know I just uh, got my first finger break in. I just, I don't know. You're familiar with swag off road. I'm like pimping them out right now. Um, I just I got their yeah, I just bought their finger brake, weld together finger brake projects. Um, I mean, I have a full weld shop in my house. It's not like a little hobby welder. I got a 300 amp Miller, you know, oh. Um, oh. major. Was, I'm glad you specified. Oh. I mean, I'm, I'm getting it. <laughs> finger <laughs> brake. <laughs> yeah. And so, like, so I got a full weld shop in my house. I take my hobbies, like, really seriously. But I got multiple welders. I can TIG. I can MIG. I don't um, have TIG, but I have MIG. <laughs> um, and so eventually I want to build the car project. You know, that's kind of, but to me, it's like I want to build it. So, and I don't have those skills yet. So I've even thought about going to auto body school. Like eventually, this is how long term I think. Like I, I want to be able to do all those things. So, you know, that's just kind of my interest. And, and I believe in general that I, I'm a lifelong learner. I'm always wanting to learn something new. And, and I think that's important for people. And especially going in with like the way the economy is going and things are getting weird and goofy. I think the people that can adapt and learn new things are the ones that are going to be successful. And the people ones with that. Skills. And, and it could be a variety of skills, right? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I could go get an entry level. Right now, I am not a great welder. I'm, I'm okay. I can do what I want to do right now, and I'm going to get better. But I don't do welding full time. So I'm not like, you know, I'm not taking and walking the cup and all that stuff. I can't do that yet. Um, but I could go get a job making money as a welder right now. I'm good enough. I mean, I've had people try to have me do things. I'm just like, I'm not doing it for anybody else. I am doing it for me. Um, but I think, you know, you need to always go out there and try to improve yourself. Always learn something new. And this is why I like talking to people like you guys, because I learn stuff from people that are doing other things. You know, I grew up, I grew up very blue collar, but, you know, I did push my three, my, you know, I got a master's degree. I put myself through school, but then I went and put myself through welding school. So I had an MBA in the welding school. It's a really funny. They, people are just like, why are you here? <laughs> because these guys are like trying to be welders and they're like, you know, this is an upgrade from their Taco Bell job, right? They're like trying to make a career and I'm just like, I'm just here to make art. Like, what? I'm like, I just want to do artwork and, and make stuff. Um, so I think, but if you have that, if you, if you stay curious, you know what I mean? Like you're just curious about how things work and you're just kind of learning stuff and you guys do that. I mean, you're getting in the mining and all this stuff. You guys are learning stuff all the time. Uh, those are the people that are going to be successful in the future. I don't care what your background or education level is. If you're willing just to learn new things always and always, you know, reach out and, and meet new people, you're going to be successful. And, and, and I try to stress that with my kids. Um, I'm always kind of reinventing myself and just trying to do new things and learn new things. And I think if you do that, you will be, you have a great future. You don't have anything to fear. That's my my take on it. Well, you're, it works. Oh, it yeah, works. for sure, for sure. All right, so we are actually over the two-hour mark. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, damn. <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. Right, right. I talk too much. Oh, it's all <laughs> good. All. 
Not it it seems to happen whenever we have guests on. They they, they go for the long. They, 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 they're on for a long time. They're like, seems like everybody's comfortable sitting there chit chatting. It's it, mm-hmm. it's awesome. <laughs> and it's, I, I it also works easier when you have more than just one person to talk to. You know, because then once you go through your, you know, 15 to 30 questions, it's like, okay, well, that's it. We're done. You know, oh, we can shoot the shit for a little while. So, well, thank well, you so much like- for being here. Well, thank you. And I and I do appreciate it, especially with the pandemic. Right. This is the way we have to connect now. You know, it's, yeah. it's hard to get together in person and do this stuff. And yep. so I do appreciate you guys doing stuff like that. And again, I do appreciate the time. Yep, for sure. For sure. I appreciate it. <clears throat> and I guess uh, with that one, we'll uh, definitely see all of you guys on the next one. Well, there you go. Peace out, Yo. guys. Have a great night. Yep. <laughs>